Act One of The Provoked Wife, a comedy by John Van Brough. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae Constant, read by Adrian Stevens. Heart Free, read by Greg Giordano. Sir John Brute, read by Alan Mapstone. Treble, a singing master, read by Todd. Razor Valet de Cham de Sir John Brute, read by Laurie Wilson. Justice of the Peace, read by Wayne Cook. Lord Rake, read by Algie Pug. Colonel Bully, companion to Sir John Brute, read by Todd. Constable, read by Leon Cole. Watchman, read by Jim Hedrick. Lady Brute, read by Wendy Katz Hiller. Belinda, her niece, read by Jen Broda. Lady Fanciful, read by Kelly Taylor. Mademoiselle, read by Sonia. Cornet, read by Yu Ting. Pipe, servant to Lady Fanciful, read by Katharina. Lovewell, read by Step Heather. Servant, read by Mia Roy. Footman, read by Red Run. Porter, read by Alan Mapstone. Taylor, read by Step Heather. Page, read by Rapunzelina. Stage directions, read by T.R. Love. The Provoked Wife, a Comedy. Prologue. Since tis the intent and business of the stage to copy out the follies of the age, to hold to every man a faithful glass and show him of what species he's an ass, I hope the next that teaches in the school will show our author he's a scribbling fool, and that the satire may be sure to bite. Kind heaven, inspire some venomed priest to write, and grant some ugly lady may indict. For I would have him lashed, by heavens I would, till his presumption swam away in blood. Three plays at once proclaim a face of brass, no matter what they are, that's not the case. To write three plays, even that's to be an ass. But what I least forgive, he knows it too, for to his cost he lately has known you. Experience shows, to many a writer smart, you hold a court where mercy never had part. So much of the old serpent's sting you have, you love to damn, as heaven delights to save. In foreign parts, let a bold volunteer, for public good, upon the stage appear. He meets ten thousand smiles to dissipate his fear, all tickle on the adventuring young beginner, and only scourge the incorrigible sinner. They touch indeed his faults, but with a hand so gentle that his merit still may stand. Kindly they buoy the follies of his pen, that he may shun em when he writes again. But tis not so in this good-natured town. All's one, an ox, a poet, or a crown. Old England's play was always knocking down. Act One, Scene One. Scene, Sir John Brute's house. Enter Sir John Solas. What cloying meat is love when matrimony's the source to it? Two years' marriage has debauched my five senses. Everything I see, everything I hear, everything I feel, everything I smell, and everything I taste, methinks has wife in it. No boy was ever so weary of his tutor, no girl of her bib, no nun of doing penance, or old maid of being chaste, as I am of being married. Sure, there's a secret curse entailed upon the very name of wife. 
my lady is a young lady a fine lady a witty lady a virtuous lady and yet i hate her there is but one thing on earth i loathe beyond her that's fighting would my courage come up to a fourth part of my ill nature i'd stand buff to her relations and thrust her out of doors but marriage has sunk me down to such an ebb of resolution i dare not draw my sword though even to get rid of my wife but here she comes enter lady brute do you dine at home to-day sir john why do you expect i should tell you what i don't know myself i thought there was no harm in asking you if thinking wrong were an excuse for impertinence women might be justified in most things they say or do i'm sorry i have said anything to displease you sorrow for things past is of as little importance to me as my dining at home or abroad ought to be to you my inquiry was only that i might have provided what you liked six to four you have been in the wrong there again for what i liked yesterday i don't like to-day and what i like to-day tis odds i mayn't like to-morrow but if i had asked you what you liked why then there would have been more asking about it than the thing was worth i wish i did but know how i might please you ay but that sort of knowledge is not a wife's talent whate'er my talent is i'm sure my will has ever been to make you easy if women were to have their wills the world would be finely governed what reason have i given you to use me as you do of late it once was otherwise you married me for love and you me for money so you have your reward and i have mine what is it that disturbs you a parson why what has he done to you he has married me exit sir john lady brute sola the devil's in the fellow i think i was told before i married him that thus twould be but i thought i had charms enough to govern him and that where there was an estate a woman must needs be happy so my vanity has deceived me and my ambition has made me uneasy but there's some comfort still if one would be revenged of him these are good times a woman may have a gallant and a separate maintenance too a surly puppy yet he's a fool for it for hitherto he has been no monster but who knows how far he may provoke me i never loved him yet i have been ever true to him and that in spite of all the attacks of art and nature upon a poor weak woman's heart in favour of a tempting lover methinks so noble a defence i have made should be rewarded with a better usage or who can tell perhaps a good part of what i suffer from my husband may be a judgment upon me for my cruelty to my lover lord with what pleasure i could indulge that thought were there but a possibility of finding arguments to make it good and how do i know but there may let me see what opposes my matrimonial vow why what did i vow i think i promised to be true to my husband well and he promised to be kind to me but he hand kept his word why then i'm absolved from mine 
Aye, that seems clear to me. The argument's good between the king and the people. Why not between the husband and the wife? Oh, but that condition was not expressed. No matter. Twas understood. Well, by all I see, if I argue the matter a little longer with myself, I shan't find so many bugbears in the way as I thought I should. Lord, what fine notions of virtue do we women take up upon the credit of old foolish philosophers? Virtue's its own reward. Virtue's this. Virtue's that. Virtue's an ass. And a gallant's worth forty on it. Enter Belinda. Good morrow, dear cousin. Good morrow, madam. You look pleased this morning. I am so. With what, pray? With my husband. Drown husbands, for yours is a provoking fellow. As he went out just now, I prayed him to tell me what time of day t'was, and he asked me if I took him for the church clock that was obliged to tell all the parish. He has been saying some good obliging things to me, too. In short, Belinda, he has used me so barbarously of late that I could almost resolve to play the downright wife and cuckold him. That would be downright indeed. Why, after all, there's more to be said for it than you'd imagine, child. I know, according to the strict statute law of religion, I should do wrong. But if there were a court of chancery in heaven, I'm sure I should cast him. If there were a house of lords, you might. In either I should infallibly carry my cause. Why, he is the first aggressor, not I. Aye, but you know we must return good for evil. That may be a mistake in the translation. Prithee, be of my opinion, Belinda, for I'm positive I'm in the right, and if you'll keep up the prerogative of a woman, you'll likewise be positive you are in the right whenever you do anything you have a mind to. But I shall play the fool and jest on till I make you begin to think I'm in earnest. I shan't take the liberty, madam, to think of anything that you desire to keep a secret from me. Alas, my dear, I have no secrets. My heart could never yet confine my tongue. Your eyes, you mean, for I'm sure I have seen them gadding when your tongue has been locked up safe enough. My eyes gadding? Prithee, after who, child? Why, after one that thinks you hate him as much as I know you love him. Constant, you mean? I do so. Lord, what should put such a thing into your head? That which puts things into most people's heads. Observation. Why, what have you observed in the name of wonder? I have observed you blush when you meet him, force yourself away from him, and then be out of humor with everything about you. In a word, never was poor creature so spurred on by desire and so reined in with fear. How strong is fancy! How weak is woman! Prithee, niece, have a better opinion of your aunt's inclination. Dear aunt, have a better opinion of your niece's understanding. You'll make me angry. You'll make me laugh. Then you are resolved to persist. Positively. And all I can say will signify nothing. Though I should swear twere false, I should think it true. Then let us both forgive. Kissing her. For we have both offended, I in making a secret, you in discovering it. Good nature may do much, but you have more reason to forgive one than I have to pardon the other. Tis true, Belinda. You have given me so many proofs of your friendship that my reserve has been indeed a crime. But that you may more easily forgive me, remember, child, that when our nature prompts us to a thing our honor and religion have forbid us, we would, were it possible, 
conceal even from the soul itself the knowledge of the body's weakness. Well, I hope to make your friend amends. You'll hide nothing from her for the future, though the body should still grow weaker and weaker. No, from this moment I have no more reserve. And for a proof of my repentance, I own, Belinda, I'm in danger. Merit and wit assault me from without. Nature and love solicit me within. My husband's barbarous usage piques me to revenge. And Satan, catching at the fair occasion, throws in my way that vengeance which of all vengeance pleases women best. "'Tis well Constant don't know the weakness of the fortification, "'for, oh, my conscience, he'd soon come on to the assault. "'Ay, and I'm afraid carry the town, too. "'But whatever you may have observed, "'I have dissembled so well as to keep him ignorant. "'So, you see, I'm no coquette, Belinda, "'and if you follow my advice, you'll never be one neither.' "'Tis true, coquetry is one of the main ingredients in the natural composition of a woman, and I, as well as others, could be well enough pleased to see a crowd of young fellows ogling and glancing and watching all occasions to do forty foolish, officious things. Nay, should some of them push on, even to hanging or drowning, why, faith— if I should let pure woman alone, I should e'en be but too well pleased with it. I'll swear twould tickle me strangely. But, after all, tis a vicious practice in us to give the least encouragement, but where we design to come to a conclusion. For tis an unreasonable thing to engage a man in a disease— which we beforehand resolve we never will apply a cure to. Tis true, but then a woman must abandon one of the supreme blessings of her life, for I am fully convinced no man has half that pleasure in possessing a mistress as a woman has in jilting a gallant. <laughs> the happiest woman then on earth must be our neighbor. Oh, the impertinent composition! She has vanity and affectation enough to make her a ridiculous original, in spite of all that art and nature ever furnished to any of her sex before her. She concludes all men her captives, and whatever course they take, it serves to confirm her in that opinion. If they shun her, she thinks tis modesty and takes it for a proof of their passion. And if they are rude to her, tis conduct and done to prevent town talk. When her folly makes them laugh, she thinks they are pleased with her wit. And when her impertinence makes them dull, concludes they are jealous of her favors. All their actions and their words she takes for granted, aim at her. And pities all other women, because she thinks they envy her. Pray, out of pity to ourselves, let us find a better subject, for I am weary of this. Do you think your husband inclined to jealousy? Oh, no. He does not love me well enough for that. Lord, how wrong men's maxims are. They are seldom jealous of their wives unless they are very fond of them, whereas they ought to consider the woman's inclination— for there depends their fate. Well, men may talk, but they are not so wise as we. That's certain. At least in our affairs. Nay, I believe we should outdo them in the business of state, too. For methinks they do and undo, and make but bad work on it. Why then don't we get into the intrigues of government as well as they? Because we have intrigues of our own that make us more sport, child. And so, let's in and consider of them. Exuant. Scene. A dressing room. Enter Lady Fanciful, Mademoiselle, and Cornet. How do I look this morning? Your ladyship looks very ill, truly. 
Lord, how ill-natured thou art, Colnet, to tell me so, though the thing should be true. Don't you know that I have humility enough to be but too easily out of conceit with myself? Hold the glass. I dare swear that will have more manners than you have. Mademoiselle, let me have your opinion too. My opinion be, madame, that your ladyship never looks so well in your life. Well, the French are the prettiest, obliging people. They say the most acceptable, well-mannered things, and never flatter. Your ladyship say great justice indeed. Nay, everything's just in my house, but Cornette. <laughs> The very looking-glass gives her the dementi. But I'm almost afraid it flatters me. It makes me look so very engaging. Looking affectedly in the glass. Indeed, madame, your face be handsomer than all the looking-glass in the world. Croyez-moi. But is it possible my eyes can be so languishing? and so very full of fire madame if the glass was burning glass i believe your eyes set the fire in the house you may take that nightgown mademoiselle get out of the room cornet i can't endure you this wench methinks does look so insufferably ugly everything look ugly madame that stand by your ladyship no really mademoiselle methinks you look mighty pretty ah madame the moon have no eclat when the sun appear oh pretty expression have you ever been in love mademoiselle oui madame sighing ah and were you beloved again non madame Oh, ye gods, what an unfortunate creature should I be in such a case. But nature has made me nice for my own defence. I'm nice, strangely nice, mademoiselle. I believe were the merit of whole mankind bestowed upon one single person, I should still think the fellow wanted something to make it worth my while to take notice of him. And yet I could love, nay, fondly love. Were it possible to have a thing made on purpose for me? For I'm not cruel, mademoiselle. I'm only nice. Ah, madame, I wish I was fine gentleman for your sake. I do all the thing in the world to get little way into your heart. I make song, I make verse, I give you the serenade, I give great many present to mademoiselle. I no eat, I no sleep, I be lean, I be mad, I hang myself, I drown myself. Ah, ma chère dame, que je vous aimerai. Embracing her. Well, the French have strange, obliging ways with them. You may take those two pair of gloves, mademoiselle. Me humbly thank my sweet lady. Enter Cornet. Madam, here's a letter for your ladyship by the penny post. Some new conquest, I'll warrant you. For, without vanity, I looked extremely clear last night when I went to the park oh agreeable here's a new song made of me and ready set too oh thou welcome thing kissing it call pipe hither she shall sing it instantly enter pipe here sing me this new song pipe fly fly you happy shepherds fly avoid fillerous charms the rigour of a heart denies the heaven that's in the arms. Never hope to gaze and then retire, nor yielding to be blessed. Nature who upon the rise of fire of eyes composed her breast. Yet lovely mate is one's believe, a slave whose zeal you move. The gods are less your youth, deceive, the heaven consists in love. 
In spite of all the thanks you owe, you may reproach in this That where they did the form bestow, they have the night their bliss Well, there may be faults, mademoiselle, but the design is so very obliging It would be a matchless ingratitude in me to discover em. Ma foi, madame, I think the gentleman's song tell you the truth If you never love, you never be happy Ah! Oh. Que j'aime l'amour, moi. Enter servant with another letter. Madam, here's another letter for your ladyship. Tis this way I am importuned every morning, mademoiselle. Pray, how do the French ladies when they are thus assassinés? <laughs> Madam, they never complain. Au contraire. When one friend's lady have got hundred lover, then she do all she can to get a hundred more. Well, strike me dead. I think they have le goubon, for tis an unutterable pleasure to be adored by all the men and envied by all the women. Yet I'll swear I'm concerned at the torture I give em. Lord, why was I formed to make the whole creation uneasy? But let me read my letter. Reads. If you have a mind to hear of your faults, instead of being praised for your virtues, take the pains to walk in the green walk at St. James with your woman an hour hence. You'll there meet one who hates you for some things, as he could love you for others, and therefore is willing to endeavour your reformation. If you come to the place I mention, you'll know who I am. If you don't, you never shall. So take your choice. This is strangely familiar, mademoiselle. Now, I have a provoking fancy to know who this impudent fellow is. Then take your scarf and your mask and go to the rendezvous. The French lady do justement comme ça. Rendezvous? What rendezvous with a man, mademoiselle? Eh, pourquoi non? What? And a man perhaps I never saw in my life. Tant mieux. C'est donc quelque chose de nouveau. Why, how do I know what designs he may have? He may intend to ravish me for aught I know. Ravish? Pagatelle. I would fain see one impudent rogue ravish, mademoiselle. Oui, je le voudrais. Oh, but my reputation, mademoiselle, my reputation, mon cher reputation. Madame, quand on l'a une fois perdu, on n'en est plus embarrassé. Fé, mademoiselle, fé, reputation is a jewel. Qui coûte bien cher, madame. Why, sure, you would not sacrifice your honor to your pleasure. Je suis philosophe. Bless me, how you talk. Why, what if honour be a burden, mademoiselle? Must it not be born? Chacun a sa façon. Quand quelque chose m'incommode, moi, je m'en défais vite. Get you gone, you little naughty Frenchwoman, you. I vow and swear I must turn you out of doors if you talk thus. Turn me out of doors? Turn yourself out of doors and go see what the gentlemen have to say to you. Tenez, voilà. Giving her her things hastily. Votre écharpe, voilà votre coiffe, voilà votre masque, voilà tout. Eh, Mercure, coquin, call one chair for madame and one other. Calling within. For me. Va-t'en vite. Turning to her lady and helping her on hastily with her things. Allons, madame, dépêchez-vous donc. Mon Dieu, quel scrupule! Well, for once, mademoiselle, 
Oh, uh, follow your advice. Out of intemperate desire, I have to know who this ill-bred fellow is. But I have too much délicatesse to make a practice on it. Belle chose vraiment que la délicatesse lorsqu'il s'agit de se divertir. Ah ça, vous voilà équipé. Partons. Eh bien, qu'avez-vous donc J'ai peur. Je n'en ai point, moi. I dare not go. Demeurez donc. Je suis pour trop. Tant pis pour vous. Curiosity is a wicked devil. C'est une charmante sainte. It ruined our first parents. Elle a bien diverti leurs enfants. L'honneur est contre. Le plaisir est pour. Must I go? Must you go? Must you eat? Must you drink? Must you sleep? Must you live? The nature bid you do one. The nature bid you do the other. Vous me ferez enrager. But when reason corrects nature, mademoiselle. Elle est donc bien insolente. C'est sa sœur aînée. Do you prefer your nature to your reason, mademoiselle? Oui, da. Pourquoi? Because my nature make me merry. My reason make me mad. Ah, le méchant François. Ah, la belle Anglaise. Forcing her lady off. End of Act One. Act Two of The Provoked Wife, a comedy by John Van Brough. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. Scene, St. James Park. Enter Lady Fanciful and Mademoiselle. Well, I vow, Mademoiselle, I'm strangely impatient to know who this confident fellow is. Enter Heartfree. Look, there's Heartfree. But sure, it can't be him. He's a professed woman hater. Yet who knows what my wicked eyes may have done. Il nous approche, madame. Yes, tis he. Now he will be most intolerably cavalier, though he should be in love with me. Madame, I'm your humble servant. I perceive you have more humility and good nature than I thought you had. What you attribute to humility and good nature, sir, may perhaps be only due to curiosity. I had a mind to know who twas had the ill manners enough to write that letter. Throwing him his letter. Well, and now I hope you are satisfied. I am so, sir. Good-bye, Thier. Nay, hold there. Though you have done your business, I hadn't done mine. By your ladyship's leave, we must have one moment's prattle together. Have you a mind to be the prettiest woman about town? or not. How she stares upon me. What? <laughs> this passes for an impertinent question with you now, because you think you are so already? Pray, sir, let me ask you a question in my turn. By what right do you pretend to examine me? By the same right that the strong govern the weak, because I have you in my power, for you cannot get so quickly to your coach but I shall have time enough to make you hear everything I have to say. These are strange liberties you take, Mr. Hartfree. They are so, madam, but there's no help for it, for know that I have a design upon you. Upon me, sir? Yes, and one that will turn to your glory and my comfort, if you will but be a little wiser than you used to be. Very well, sir. Let me see. Your vanity, madam, I take to be about some eight degrees higher than any woman's in the town. Let t'other be who she will, and my indifference is naturally about the same pitch. Now, could you find the way to turn this indifference 
into fire and flames, methinks your vanity ought to be satisfied, and this perhaps you might bring about upon pretty reasonable terms. And pray, at what rate would this indifference be bought off, if one should have so depraved an appetite to desire it? Why, madam, to drive a Quaker's bargain, and make but one word with you, if I do part with it, you must lay me down your affectation. My affectation, sir? Why, I ask you nothing but what you may very well spare. You grow rude, sir. Come, mademoiselle, tis high time to be gone. Allons, allons, allons. Hartfrey, stopping them. Nay, you may as well stand still, for hear me, you shall. Walk which way you please. What mean you, sir? I mean to tell you that you are the most ungrateful woman upon earth. Ungrateful? To whom? To nature. Why, what has nature done for me? What you have undone by art. It made you handsome. It gave you beauty to a miracle, a shape without a fault, wit enough to make them relish, and so turned you loose to your own discretion, which has made such work with you that you are become the pity of our sex and the jest of your own. There is not a feature in your face, but you have found the way to teach it some affected convulsion. Your feet, your hands, your very fingers' ends are directed never to move without some ridiculous air or other, and your language is a suitable trumpet to draw people's eyes upon the rare show. Mademoiselle aside. Est-ce qu'on fait l'amour en Angleterre comme ça? Lady Fanciful aside. Now I could cry for madness, but that I know he'd laugh at me for it. Now, did you hate me for telling you the truth? But that's because you don't believe it is so. For were you once convinced of that, you'd reform for your own sake. But tis as hard to persuade a woman to quit anything that makes her ridiculous, as tis to prevail with a poet to see a fault in his own play. Every circumstance of nice breeding must needs appear ridiculous to one who has so natural an antipathy to good manners. But suppose I could find the means to convince you that the whole world is of my opinion, and that those who flatter and commend you do it to no other intent but to make you persevere in your folly, that they may continue in their mirth. Sir, though you and all the world you talk of should be so imperfectly officious as to think to persuade me I don't know how to behave myself, I should still have charity enough for my own understanding to believe myself in the right, and all you in the wrong. Le voilà mort. Exuant Lady Fanciful and Mademoiselle, Hartfrey gazing after her. There her single clapper has published the sense of the whole sex. Well, this once I have endeavoured to wash the blackmoor white, but henceforward I'll sooner undertake to teach sincerity to a courtier, generosity to a usurer, honesty to a lawyer, nay, humility to a divine, than discretion to a woman I see has once set her heart upon playing the fool. Enter Constant. Morrow, Constant. Good morrow, Jack. What are you doing here this morning? Doing? Guess, if thou canst. Why, I have been endeavouring to persuade my lady fanciful that she is the foolishest woman about town. A pretty endeavour, truly. I have told her, in as plain English as I could speak, both what the town says of her and what I think of her. In short, I have used her as an absolute king would do Magna Carta. And how does she take it? 
as children do pills bite them but can't swallow them but prithee what has put it into your head of all mankind to turn reformer why one thing was the morning hung upon my hands i did not know what to do with myself and another was as little as i care for women i could not see with patience one that heaven had taken such wondrous pains about be so very industrious to make herself the jack pudding of the creation well now could i almost wish to see my cruel mistress make the self-same use of what heaven has done for her that i might be cured of a disease that makes me so very uneasy for love love is the devil heart free and why do you let the devil govern you because i have more flesh and blood than grace and self-denial my dear dear mistress sdeath that so genteel her woman should be a saint when religion's out of fashion nay she is much in the wrong truly but who knows how far time and good example may prevail oh they may have played their parts in vain already tis now two years since that damned fellow her husband invited me to his wedding and there was the first time i saw that charming woman whom i have loved ever since more than e'er a martyr did his soul but she is cold my friend still cold as the northern star so are all women by nature which makes them so willing to be warmed oh don't profane the sex prithee think them all angels for her sake for she's virtuous even to a fault a lover's head is a good accountable thing truly he adores his mistress for being virtuous and yet is very angry with her because she won't be lewd well the only relief i expect in my misery is to see thee some day or other as deeply engaged as myself which will force me to be merry in the midst of all my misfortunes that day will never come be assured ned not but that i can pass a night with a woman and for the time perhaps make myself as good sport as you can do nay i can court a woman too call her nymph angel goddess what you please but here's the difference twixt you and i i persuade a woman she's an angel and she persuades you she's one prithee let me tell you how i avoid falling in love that which serves me for prevention may chance to serve you for a cure well use the ladies moderately then and i'll hear you that using them moderately undoes us all but i'll use them justly that you ought to be satisfied with i always consider a woman not as the tailor the shoemaker the tire woman the seamstress and which is more than all that the poet makes her but i consider her as pure nature has contrived her and that more strictly than i should have done our old grandmother eve had i seen her naked in the garden for i consider her turned inside out her heart well examined i find there pride vanity covetousness indiscretion but above all things malice plots eternally a forging to destroy one another's reputations and as honestly to change the levity of men's tongues with the scandal hourly debates how to make poor gentlemen in love with them with no other intent but to use them like dogs when they have done a constant desire of doing more mischief and an everlasting war waged against truth and good nature 
Very well, sir, an admirable composition, truly. Then, for her outside, I consider it merely as an outside. She's a thin, tiffany covering over just such stuff as you and I are made on. As for her motion, her mien, her airs, and all those tricks, I know they affect you mightily. If you should see your mistress at a coronation, dragging her peacock's train with all her state and insolence about her, twould strike you with all the awful thoughts that heaven itself could pretend to from you, whereas I turn the whole matter into a jest, and suppose her strutting in the self-same stately manner, with nothing on her but her stays and her under-scanty quilted petticoat. Hold thy profane tongue, for I'll hear no more. What? You'll love on, then? Yes, to eternity. Yet you have no hopes at all? None. Nay, the resolution may be discreet enough. Perhaps you have found out some new philosophy, that love, like a virtue, is its own reward. So you and your mistress will be as well content at a distance as others that have less learning are in coming together. No, but if she should prove kind at last, my dear heart free. Embracing him. Nay, prithee, don't take me for your mistress, for lovers are very troublesome. Well, who knows what time may do? And just now he was sure time could do nothing. Yet not one kind glance in two years is somewhat strange. Not strange at all. She don't like you. That's all the business. Prithee, don't distract me. Nay, you are a good, handsome young fellow. She might use you better. Come, will you go see her? Perhaps she may have changed her mind. There's some hopes as long as she's a woman. Oh, tis in vain to visit her. Sometimes to get a sight of her, I visit that beast, her husband. But she certainly finds some pretense to quit the room as soon as I enter. Tis much she don't tell him you have made love to her too, for that's another good-natured thing usual amongst women, in which they have several ends. Sometimes tis to recommend their virtue, that they may be lewd with the greater security. Sometimes tis to make their husbands fight, in hopes they may be killed, when their affairs require it should be so. But most commonly, tis to engage two men in a quarrel, that they may have the credit of being fought for. And if the lover's killed in the business, they cry, Poor fellow, he had ill luck. And so they go to cards. Thy injuries to women are not to be forgiven. Look to it, if ever thou dost fall into their hands. They can't use me worse than they do you that speak well of them. Oh, ho, oh, here comes the knight. Enter Sir John Brute. Your humble servant, Sir John. Servant, sir. How does all your family? Pox of my family. How dost your lady? I haven't seen her abroad a good while. Do? I don't know how she does, not I. She was well enough yesterday. I ain't been home tonight. What? Were you out of town? Out of town? No, I was drinking. You are a true Englishman. Don't know your own happiness. If I were married to such a woman, I would not be from her a night for all the wine in France. Not from her. Oons, what a time should a man have of that? Why? There's no division, I hope. No, 
but there's a conjunction and that's worse a pox of the parson why the plague don't you two marry i fancy i look like the devil to you why you don't think you have horns do you no i believe my wife's religion will keep her honest and what will make her keep her religion persecution and therefore she shall have it have a care knight women are tender things and yet methinks tis a hard matter to break their hearts fie fie you have one of the best wives in the world and yet you seem the most uneasy husband best wives no woman's well enough she has no voice that i know of but she's a wife and damn a wife if i were married to a hogshead of claret matrimony would make me hate it why did you marry then you were old enough to know your own mind why did i marry i married because i had a mind to lie with her and she would not let me why did you not ravish her yes and so have hedged myself in to forty quarrels with her relations besides buying my pardon but more than all that you must know i was afraid of being damned in those days for i kept sneaking cowardly company fellows that went to church said grace to their meat and had not the least tincture of quality about them but i think you are got into a better gang now zoon sir my lord rake and i are hand in glove i believe that we may get our bones broke together to-night have you a mind to share a frolic not i truly my talent lies to softer exercises what a down bed and a strumpet a pox of venery i say will you come and drink with me this afternoon i can't drink to-day but we'll come and sit an hour with you if you will <sighs> pox sit an hour why can't you drink because i'm to see my mistress who's that why do you use to tell yes so won't i why because tis a secret would my wife knew it to be no secret long why do you think she can't keep a secret no more than she can keep lint prithee tell it her to try constant no prithee don't that i mayn't be plagued with it i'll hold you a guinea you don't make her tell it you i'll hold you a guinea i do which way why i'll beg her not to tell it me nay if anything does it that will but do you think sir own oh, sir i think a woman and a secret are the two impertinentest themes in the universe therefore pray let's hear no more of my wife nor your mistress damn em both with all my heart and everything else that dangles a petticoat except four generous whores with betty sands at the head of em who are drunk with my lord rake and i ten times a fortnight exit sir john here's a dainty fellow for you and the veriest coward too but his usage of his wife makes me ready to stab the villain lovers are short-sighted all their senses run into that of feeling this proceeding of his is the only thing on earth can make your fortune if anything can prevail with her to accept of a gallant tis his ill usage of her for women will do more for revenge than they'll do for the gospel prithee take heart i have great hopes for you 
and since I can't bring you quite off of her, I'll endeavor to bring you quite on, for a whining lover is the damnedest companion upon earth. My dear friend, flatter me a little more with these hopes, for whilst they prevail, I have heaven within me, and could melt with joy. Pray, no melting yet. Let things go farther first. This afternoon, perhaps, we shall make some advance. In the meanwhile, let's go dine at Lockett's, and let hope get you a stomach. Exuant. Scene, Lady Fanciful's house. Enter Lady Fanciful and Mademoiselle. Did you ever see anything so importune, mademoiselle? Indeed, madame, to say the truth, he wants little good breeding. Good breeding? He wants to be Cain, mademoiselle, an insolent fellow. And yet, let me expose my weakness. Tis the only man on earth I could resolve to dispense my favours on. Were he but a fine gentleman? Well, did men but know how deep an impression a fine gentleman makes in a lady's heart, they would reduce all their studies to that of good breeding alone. Enter Cornet. Madam, here's Mr. Treble. He has brought home the verses your ladyship made, and gave him to set. Oh, let him come in by all means. Now, mademoiselle... I am going to be unspeakably happy. Enter Treble. So, Mr. Treble, you have set my little dialogue? Yes, madam, and I hope your ladyship will be pleased with it. Oh, no doubt on it, for really, Mr. Treble, you set all things to a wonder. But your music is in particular heavenly when you have my words to clothe in it. Your words themselves, madam, have so much music in them, they inspire me. Nay, now you make me blush, Mr. Treble, but pray, let's hear what you've done. You shall, madam, a song to be sung by a man and a woman. Ah, lovely nymph, the world's on fire, veil, veil those cruel eyes. The world may then in flames expire, and boast that so it dies. But when all mortals are destroyed, who then shall sing your praise? Those who are fit to be employed, the gods shall altars raise. How does your ladyship like it, madam? Rapture, rapture, Mr. Treble. I'm all rapture. Oh, wit and art! What power have you when joined? I must needs tell you the birth of this little dialogue. Mr. Treble, its father was a dream, and its mother was the moon. I dreamed that by a unanimous vote I was chosen queen of that pale world, and that the first time I appeared upon my throne all my subjects fell in love with me. Just when I waked, seeing pen, ink, and paper lie idle upon the table, I slid into my morning gown and writ this impromptu. So I guess the dialogue, madam, is supposed to be between your majesty and your first minister of state. Just. He, as minister, advises me to trouble my head about the welfare of my subjects, which I, as sovereign, find a very impertinent proposal. But is the town so dull, Mr. Treble, it affords us never another new song? Madam, I have one in my pocket, came out but yesterday, if your ladyship pleases to let Mrs. Pipe sing it. By all means. Here, Pipe, make what music you can of this song here. Now the angel dwells above, half so fair as her I love. Heaven knows how she'll receive me. If she smiles, I'm blessed indeed. If she frowns, I'm quickly free. Heaven knows she ne'er can grieve me. 
Man can love her more than I, yet she never shall make me die, if my flame can never warm her. Lasting beauty I'll adore, I shall never love her more, cruelty will so deform her. Very well. This is heart freeze poetry without question. Oh, won't your ladyship please to sing yourself this morning? Oh, Lord, Mr. Treble, my cold is still so barbarous to refuse me that pleasure. <laughs> I'm very sorry for it, madam. Methinks all mankind should turn physicians for the cure on it. Why, truly, to give mankind their due, there's few that know me but have offered their remedy. They have reason, madam, for I know nobody sings so near a cherubim as your ladyship. What I do I owe chiefly to your skill and care, Mr. Treble. People do flatter me, indeed, that I have a voice, a je ne sais quoi, in the conduct of it, that will make music of anything. And truly, I begin to believe so, since what happened to the night? Would you think it, Mr. Treble, walking pretty late in the park, for I often walk late in the park, Mr. Treble, a whim took me to sing Chevichets, and would you believe it, next morning I had three copies of verses and six billets doux at my levy upon it. And without all dispute, you deserved as many more, madam. Are there any further commands for your ladyship's humble servant? Nothing more at this time, Mr. Treble, but I shall expect you here every morning this month to sing my little matter there to me. I'll reward you for your pains. Oh, Lord, madam. Good morrow, sweet Mr. Treble. Your ladyship's most obedient servant. Exit Treble. Enter servant. Will your ladyship please to dine yet? Yes, let him serve. Exit servant. Sure this heart free has bewitched me, mademoiselle. You can't imagine how oddly he mixed himself in my thoughts during my rapture even now. I vow tis a thousand pities he is not more polished. Don't you think so? Madame, I think it's so great pity that if I was in your ladyship place, I take him home in my house, I lock him up in my closet, and I never let him go till I teach him everything that fine lady expect from fine gentlemen. Why, truly, I believe I should soon subdue his brutality, for without a doubt he has a strange penchant to grow fond of me, in spite of his aversion to the sex else he would never have taken so much pains about me. Lord, how proud would some poor creatures be of such a conquest! But I, alas, I don't know how to receive as favour what I take to be so infinitely my due. But what shall I do to new mould him, mademoiselle? For till then... He's my utter aversion. Madame, you must laugh at him in all the place that you meet him, and turn into the ridicule all he say and all he do. Why, truly, satire has ever been of wondrous use to reform ill manners. Besides, tis my particular talent to ridicule folks. I can't be severe strangely severe when i will mademoiselle give me pen and ink i find myself whimsical i'll write to him oh i'll let it alone and be severe upon him that way sitting down to write rising up again yet active severity is much better than passive sitting down "'Tis as good let alone, too. "'For every lash I give him, perhaps, he'll take his favour. "'Rising. "'Yet tis a thousand pities so much satire should be lost. "'Sitting. 
but if it should have a wrong effect upon him, twould distract me. Rising. Well, I must write, though, after all. Sitting. Or I'll let it alone, which is the same thing. Rising. La voilà déterminée. Exuent. End of Act Two. Act Three of The Provoked Wife, a comedy by John Van Bru. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three. Scene opens. Sir John, Lady Brute, and Belinda rising from the table. Here, take away the things. I expect company. But first bring me my pipe. I'll smoke. To a servant. Lord Sir John, I wonder you won't leave that nasty custom. Pretty, don't be impertinent. Belinda to Lady Brute. I wonder who those people are he expects this afternoon. I'd give the world to know. Perhaps tis constant. He comes here sometimes. If it does prove him, I'm resolved I'll share the visit. We'll send for our work and sit here. He'll choke us with his tobacco. Nothing will choke us when we are doing what we have a mind to. Lovewell. Enter Lovewell. Madam? Here, bring my cousin's work and mine hither. Exit Lovewell and re-enters with their work. Oh, Pox, can't you work somewhere else? We shall be careful not to disturb you, sir. Your pipe would make you too thoughtful, uncle, if you were left alone. Our priddle prattle will cure your spleen. Will it so, Mrs. Pert? Now I believe it will so increase it. Sitting and smoking. I shall take my own house for a paper mill. Lady Brute to Belinda aside. Don't let's mind him. Let him say what he will. A woman's tongue, a cure for the spleen. Oons. Aside. If a man had got the headache... They be for applying the same remedy. You have done a great deal, Belinda, since yesterday. Yes, I have worked very hard. How do you like it? Oh, tis the prettiest fringe in the world. Well, cousin, you have the happiest fancy. Prithee, advise me about altering my crimson petticoat. Ah, pox for your petticoat. Here's such a praising, a man can't digest his own thoughts for you. Don't answer him. Aside. Well, what do you advise me? Why, really, I would not alter it at all. Methinks tis very pretty as it is. Aye, that's true. But you know, one grows weary of the prettiest things in the world when one has had them long. Yes, I have taught her that. Shall we provoke him a little? With all my heart. Belinda, don't you long to be married? Why, there are some things in it I could like well enough. What do you think you should dislike? My husband, a hundred to one else. Oh, you wicked wretch. Sure you don't speak as you think. Yes, I do, especially if he smoked tobacco. He looks earnestly at him. Why, that many times takes off worse smells. Then he must smell very ill indeed. So some men will, to keep their wives from coming near him. Then those wives should cuckold him at a distance. He rises in a fury, throws his pipe at him, and drives him out. As they run off, Constant and Hartfree enter. Lady Brute runs against Constant. Oons, get you gone upstairs, you confederating strumpets, you, or I'll cuckold you with a vengeance. Oh, Lord, he'll beat us, he'll beat us. Dear, dear Mr. Constance, save us. Exuant. I'll cuckold you with a pox. Heaven, 
Sir John, what's the matter? Sure, if women had been ready created, the devil, instead of being kicked down into hell, had been married. Why, what new plague have you found now? Mm, I, these two gentlewomen did but hear me say I expected you here this afternoon, upon which they presently resolved to take up the room a purpose to plague me and my friends. Was that all? Why, we should have been glad of their company. Then I should have been weary of yours, for I can't relish both together. They found fault with my smoking tobacco, too, and said men stunk. But I have a good mind to say something. No, nothing against the ladies, pray. Split the ladies. Come, will you sit down? Give us some wine, fellow. You won't smoke. No, nor drink neither at this time. I must ask your pardon. What? This mistress of yours runs in your head. I'll warrant it's some such squeamish minx as my wife, that's grown so dainty of late she finds fault even with a dirty shirt. That a woman may do, and not be very dainty neither. Pox of the women! Let's drink. Come, you shall take one glass, though I send for a box of lozenges to sweeten your mouth after it. Nay, if one glass will satisfy you, I'll drink it without putting you to that expense. Why, that's honest. Fill some wine, sirrah. So is to you, gentlemen, a wife's the devil to your being both married. They drink. Oh, your most humble servant, sir. Well, how do you like my wine? Tis very good, indeed. Tis admirable. Then give us to the glass. No, pray excuse us now. We'll come another time, and then we won't spare it. This one glass and no more. Come, it shall be your mistress's health. And that's a great compliment from me, I assure you. And tis a very obliging one to me. So give us the glasses. So let her live. <coughs> Sir John coughs in the glass. And be kind. What's the matter? Does it go the wrong way? If I had love enough to be jealous, I should have taken this for an ill omen, for I never drank my wife's health in my life, but I puked in the glass. Oh, she's too virtuous to make a reasonable man jealous. Pox of her virtue! If I could but catch her adulterating, I might be divorced from her by law. And so pay her a yearly pension to be a distinguished cuckold. Enter servant. Sir, there's my lord Rake, Colonel Bully, and some other gentlemen at the Blue Posts desire your company. Could so. We are to consult about playing the devil tonight. Well, we won't hinder business. Methinks I don't know how to leave you, though. But for once I must make bold, or, look you, maybe the conference mayn't last long. So, if you'll wait here half an hour or an hour, if I don't come then, why, then, I won't come at all. Hartfrey to Constant. A good, modest proposition, truly. Aside. But... Let's accept, aunt. However, who knows what may happen? Well, sir, to show you how fond we are of your company, we'll expect your return as long as we can. Nay, maybe I mayn't stay at all. But business, you know, must be done. 
so your servant or hark you if you have a mind to take a frisk with us i have an interest with my lord i can easily introduce you we are much beholden to you but for my part i'm engaged another way what to your mistress i'll warrant prithee leave your nasty punk to entertain herself with her own lewd thoughts and make one with us to-night sir tis business that is to employ me and me and business must be done you know ay women's business though the world were consumed for it exit sir john farewell beast and now my dear friend would my mistress be but as complacent as some men's wives who think it a piece of good breeding to receive the visits of their husband's friends in his absence why for your sake i could forgive her though she should be so complacent to receive something else in his absence but what way shall we invent to see her oh ne'er hope it invention will prove as vain as wishes enter lady brute and belinda what do you think now friend i think i shall swoon i'll speak first then whilst you fetch breath we think ourselves obliged gentlemen to come and return you thanks for your knight errantry we were just upon being devoured by the fiery dragon did not his fumes almost knock you down gentlemen truly ladies we did undergo some hardships and should have done more if some greater heroes than ourselves hard by had not diverted him though i am glad of the service you are pleased to say we have done you yet i am sorry we could do it no other way than by making ourselves privy to what you would perhaps have kept a secret for sir john's part i suppose he designed it no secret since he made so much noise and for myself truly i am not much concerned since tis fallen only into this gentleman's hands and yours who i have many reasons to believe will neither interpret nor report anything to my disadvantage your good opinion madam was what i feared i never could have merited your fears were vain then sir for i'm just to everybody prithee constant what is it you do to get the ladies good opinions for i'm a novice at it sir will you give me leave to instruct you yes that i will with all my soul madam why then you must never be slovenly never be out of humour farewell and cry roast meat smoke tobacco nor drink but when you are dry that's hard nay if you take his bottle from him you'll break his heart madam why is it possible the gentleman can love drinking only by way of antidote against what pray against love madam are you afraid of being in love sir i should if there were any danger of it pray why so because i always had an aversion to being used like a dog why truly men in love are seldom used better but was you never in love sir no i thank heaven madam pray where you got your learning then from other people's expense that's being a sponger sir which is scarce honest if you'd buy some experience with your own money as twould be fairly your got, so twould stick longer by you. Enter footman. Madam, here's my lady fanciful to wait upon your ladyship. Shield me, kind heaven! What an inundation of impertinence is here coming upon us! Enter lady fanciful, who runs first to lady brute, then to Belinda, kissing him. 
my dear Lady Rood and sweet Belinda, methinks tis an age since I saw you. Yet tis but three days. Sure you have passed your time very ill, it seems so long to you. Why, really, to confess the truth to you, I am so everlastingly fatigued with the address of unfortunate gentlemen that were it not for the extravagancy of the example, I should e'en tear out these wicked eyes with my own fingers to make both myself and mankind easy. What think you on it, Mr. Hartfree? For I take you to be my faithful adviser. Why, truly, madam, I think, every project that is for the good of mankind ought to be encouraged. Then I have your consent, sir. To do whatever you please, madam. You had a much more limited complacence this morning, sir. Would you believe it, ladies? The gentleman has been so exceeding generous to tell me of above fifty faults in less than it was possible for me to commit two of them. Why, truly, madam, my friend there is apt to be something familiar with the ladies. He is indeed, sir but he's wondrous charitable with it. He has had the goodness to design a reformation, even down to my fingers' ends. T'was thus, I think, sir. Opening her fingers in an awkward manner. You'll have had them stand. My eyes, too, he did not like. How was it you would have directed them? Thus, I think. Staring at him. Then there was something amiss in my gait, too. I don't know well how t'was, but as I take it, he would have had me walk like him. Pray, sir, do me the favour to take a turn or two about the room, that the company may see you. He's sullen, ladies, and won't. But, to make short, and give you as true an idea as I can of the matter, I think t'was much about this figure, in general, he would have moulded me to. But I was an obstinate woman, and could not resolve to make myself mistress of his heart by growing as awkward as his fancy. She walks awkwardly about, staring and looking ungainly, then changes on a sudden to the extremity of her usual affectation. Just thus women do when they think we are in love with them, or when they are so with us. Here Constant and Lady Brute talk together apart. T'would, however, be less vanity for me to conclude the former than you the latter, sir. Madam, all I shall presume to conclude is that if I were in love, you'd find the means to make me soon weary on it. Not by over-fondness upon my word, sir. But pray, let's stop here, for you are so much governed by instinct. I know you'll grow brutish at last. Belinda aside. Now I am sure she's fond of him. I'll try to make her jealous. Well, for my part, I should be glad to find somebody would be so free with me that I might know my faults and mend them. Then pray, let me recommend this gentleman to you. I have known him some time, and will be surety for him, that upon a very limited encouragement on your side, you shall find an extended impudence on his. I thank you, madam, for your recommendation. But hating idleness, I'm unwilling to enter into a place where I believe there would be nothing to do. I was fond of serving your ladyship, because I knew you'd find me constant employment. I told you he'd be rude, Belinda. Oh, a little bluntness is a sign of honesty, which makes me always ready to pardon it. So, sir, if you have no other exceptions to my service but the fear of being idle in it, you may venture to lift yourself. I shall find you work, I warrant you. Upon those terms I engage, madam. And this... With your leave, I take for earnest. Offering to kiss her hand. Hold there, sir. I'm none of your earnest givers. 
but if I'm well served, I give good wages and pay punctually. Hartfrey and Belinda seem to continue talking familiarly. Lady Fanciful, aside. I don't like this jesting between them. Methinks the fool begins to look as if he were in earnest. But then he must be a fool indeed. Lord, what a difference there is between me and her. Looking at Belinda scornfully. How I should despise such a thing if I were a man. What a nose she has. What a chin. What a neck. Then her eyes. And the worst kissing lips in the universe. No, no. He can never like her. That's positive. Yet I can't suffer them together any longer. Mr. Hartfree, do you know that you and I must have no quarrel for all this? I can't forbear being a little severe now and then, but women, you know, may be allowed anything. Up to a certain age, madam. Which I'm not yet past, I hope. Hartfree aside. Nor... Never will, I dare swear. Lady Fanciful to Lady Brute. Come, madam, will your lady should be witness to our reconciliation? You agree, then, at last? Hartfree slightingly. We forgive. Lady Fanciful aside. That was a cold, ill-natured reply. Then there's no challenges sent between you? Not for me. I promise. Aside to Constant. But that's more than I'll do for her, for I know she can as well be damned as forbear writing to me. That I believe, but I think we had best be going, lest she should suspect something and be malicious. With all my heart. Ladies, we are your humble servants. I see Sir John is quite engaged. Twould be in vain to expect him. Come, Hartfree. Exit. Ladies, your servant. To Belinda. I hope, madam, you won't forget our bargain. I am to say what I please to you. Exit Hartfree. Liberty of speech entire, sir. Lady Fanciful aside. Very pretty, truly. But now the blockhead went out, languishing at her, and not a look toward me. Well, churchmen may talk, but miracles are not ceased. For tis more natural such a rude fellow as he, and such a little impertinent as she, should be capable of making a woman of my sphere uneasy. But I can bear her sight no longer. Methinks she's grown ten times uglier than Cornet. I must home and study revenge. To Lady Brute. Madam, your humble servant, I must take my leave. What? Going already, madam? I must beg you'll excuse me this once, for really I have eighteen visits to return this afternoon. So you see I'm importuned by the women as well as the men. Belinda, aside. And she quits them both. Lady Fanciful, going. Nay, you shan't go one step out of the room. Indeed. I'll wait upon you down. No, sweet Lady Brute, you know I swoon at ceremony. Pray give me leave. You know I won't. Indeed, I must. Indeed, you shan't. Indeed, I will. Indeed, you shan't. Indeed, I will. Indeed, you shan't. Indeed, 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 you shan't. Exit Lady Fanciful. Running, they follow. Re-enter Lady Brute. Sola. This impertinent woman has put me out of humor for a fortnight. What an agreeable moment has her foolish visit interrupted. Lord... How like a torrent love flows into the heart when once the sluice of desire is opened. Good gods, what a pleasure there is in doing what we should not do. Re-enter Constant. Ah, here again. 
Though the renewing my visit may seem a little irregular, I hope I shall obtain your pardon for it, madam, when you know I only left the room, lest the lady who was here should have been as malicious in her remarks as she's foolish in her conduct. He who has discretion enough to be tender of a woman's reputation carries a virtue about him may atone for a great many faults. If it has a title to atone for any, its pretensions must needs be strongest, where the crime is love. I therefore hope I shall be forgiven the attempt I have made upon your heart, since my enterprise has been a secret to all the world but yourself. Secrecy, indeed, in sins of this kind, is an argument of weight to lessen the punishment. But nothing's a plea for a pardon entire without a sincere repentance. If sincerity in repentance consists in sorrow for offending, no cloister ever enclosed so true a penitent as I should be, but I hope it cannot be reckoned an offence to love where tis a duty to adore. Tis an offence, a great one, where it would rob a woman of all she ought to be adored for, her virtue. Virtue? Virtue, alas, is no more like the thing that's called so than tis like vice itself. Virtue consists in goodness, honour, gratitude, sincerity, and pity, and not in peevish, snarling, straight-laced chastity. True virtue, wheresoever it moves, still carries an intrinsic worth about it, and is in every place and in each sex of equal value. So is not continence, you see, that phantom of honour which men in every age have so condemned, they have thrown it amongst the women to scrabble for. If it be a thing of so little value, why do you so earnestly recommend it to your wives and daughters? We recommend it to our wives, madam, because we would keep em to ourselves, and to our daughters, because we would dispose of em to others. Tis then of some importance, it seems, since you can't dispose of them without it. That importance, madam, lies in the humour of the country, not in the nature of the thing. How do you prove that, sir? From the wisdom of a neighbouring nation, in a contrary practice. In monarchies, things go by whimsy, but commonwealths weigh all things in the scale of reason. I hope we are not so very light a people to bring up fashions without some ground. Pray, what does your ladyship think of a powdered coat for deep mourning? I think, sir, your sophistry has all the effect that you can reasonably expect it should have. It puzzles, but don't convince. I am sorry for it. I'm sorry to hear you say so. Pray, why? Because, if you expected more from it, you have a worse opinion of my understanding than I desire you should have. Constant aside. I comprehend her. She would have me set a value upon her chastity, that I might think myself the more obliged to her when she makes me a present of it. To her? I beg you will believe I did not but rally, madam. I know you judge too well of right and wrong to be deceived by arguments like those. I hope you'll have so favourable an opinion of my understanding, too, to believe the thing called virtue 
as worth enough with me to pass for an eternal obligation where'er tis sacrificed. It is, I think, so great a one as nothing can repay. Yes, making the man you love your everlasting debtor. When debtors once have borrowed all we have to lend, they are very apt to grow shy of their creditor's company. That, madam, is only when they are forced to borrow of usurers and not of a generous friend. Let us choose our creditors, and we are seldom so ungrateful to shun them. What think you of Sir John, sir? I was his free choice. I think he's married, madam. Does marriage, then, exclude men from your rule of constancy? It does. Constance's a brave, free, haughty, generous agent that cannot buckle to the chains of wedlock. There's a poor, sordid slavery in marriage that turns the flowing tide of honour and sinks us to the lowest ebb of infamy. Tis a corrupted soil, ill nature, avarice, sloth, cowardice, and dirt are all its product. Have you no exceptions to this general rule, as well as to t'other? Yes, I would, after all, be an exception to it myself, if you were free in power and will to make me so. Compliments are well placed where tis impossible to lay hold on em. I would to heaven twere possible for you to lay hold on mine, that you might see it is no compliment at all. But since you are already disposed of, beyond redemption, to one who does not know the value of the jewel you have put into his hands, I hope you would not think him greatly wronged, though it should sometimes be looked on by a friend who knows how to esteem it as he ought. If looking on it alone would serve his turn, the wrong, perhaps, might not be very great. Why, what if he should wear it now and then a day, so he give good security to bring it home again at night? Small security, I fancy, might serve for that. One might venture to take his word. Then where's the injury to the owner? "'Tis an injury to him if he think it one, for if happiness be seated in the mind, unhappiness must be so too. "'Here I close with you, madam, and draw my conclusive argument from your own position. "'If the injury lie in the fancy, there needs nothing but secrecy to prevent the wrong.' "'Lady Brute, going.' A surer way to prevent it is to hear no more arguments in its behalf. Constant following her. But, madam... But, sir, tis my turn to be discreet now, and not suffer too long a visit. Constant catching her hand. By heaven, you shall not stir till you give me hopes that I shall see you again at some more convenient time and place. I give you just hopes enough. Breaking from him. To get loose from you, and that's all I can afford you at this time. Exit running. Constant solace. Now, by all that's great and good, she is a charming woman. In what ecstasy of joy she has left me, for she gave me hope. Did she not say she gave me hope? Hope, I, what hope? Enough to make me let her go. Why, that's enough in conscience. Or no matter how t'was spoke, hope was the word. It came from her, and it was said to me. Enter Hartfree. Ha, Hartfree, thou hast done me noble service, 
in prattling to the young gentlewoman without there. Come to my arms, thou venerable board, and let me squeeze thee. Embracing him eagerly. As a new pair of stays does a fat country girl when she's carried to court to stand for a maid of honour. Why, what the devil's all this rapture for? Rapture? There's ground for rapture, man. There's hopes, my heart free. Hopes, my friend. Hopes of what? Why? Hopes that my lady and I together, for tis more than one body's work, should make Sir John a cuckold. Prithee, what did she say to thee? Say? What did she not say? She said that, says she, she said, Zounds, I don't know what she said, but she looked as if she said everything I'd have her. And so, if thou'lt go to the tavern, I'll treat thee with anything that gold can buy. I'll give all my silver amongst the drawers, make a bonfire before the door, say that plenipos have signed the peace, and the Bank of England's grown honest. Exuant. Scene opens. Lord Rake, Sir John, and company at a table drinking. Huzzah! Come, boys, charge again. So, confusion to all order. Here's liberty of conscience. Huzzah! Huzzah! I'll sing you a song I made this morning to this purpose. Tis wicked, I hope. Don't, my lord, tell you he made it? Well, then, let's have it. What a pother of late have they kept in the state About setting our conscience free. A bottle has more dispensations in store Than the king and the state can decree. When my head's full of wine, I o'erflow with design, And know no penal laws that can curb me. Whate'er I devise seems good in my eyes, and religion ne'er dares to disturb me. No saucy remorse intrudes in my course, nor impertinent notions of evil. So there's claret in store, in peace I've my whore, and in peace I jog on to the devil. So there's claret in store, in peace is my whore, and in peace I jog on to the devil. Lord Rake repeats. And in peace I jog on to the devil. Well, how do you like it, gentlemen? Oh, admirable. I would not give a fig. For a song that is not full of sin and impudence. Then my muse is to your taste. But drink away. The night steals upon us. We shall want time to be lewd in. Hey, page, sally out, sirrah, and see what's doing in the camp. We'll beat up their quarters presently. I'll bring your lordship an exact account. Exit, page. Now let the spirit of Clary go round. Fill me a brimmer. Here's to our forlorn hope. Courage, knight. Victory attends you. And Laurel shall crown me. Drink away and be damned. Again, boys. To the glass and damn morality. Sir John, drunk. I damn morality. And damn the watch, and let the constable be married. Huzzah! Re-enter, page. How are the streets inhabited, Siddhar? My lord, tis Sunday night. They are full of drunken citizens. Along then, boys, we'll have a feast. Along, noble knight. Aye, along, bully. 
and he that says sir john brute is not as drunk and as religious as the drunkenest citizen of them all is a liar and the son of a whore why that was bravely spoke and like a free-born englishman what's that to you sir whether i am an englishman or a frenchman zounds you are not angry sir zounds i am angry sir for if i'm a free-born englishman what have you to do even to talk of my privileges why prithee knight don't quarrel here leave private animosities to be decided by daylight let the night be employed against the public enemy my lord i respect you because you are a man of quality but i'll make that fellow know i am within a hair's breadth as absolute by my privileges as the king of france is by his prerogative he by his prerogative takes money where it is not his due i by my privilege refuse paying it where i owe it liberty and property and old england huzzah huzzah, huzzah. exit sir john reeling all following him scene a bedchamber enter lady brute and belinda sure tis late belinda i begin to be sleepy yes tis near twelve will you go to bed to bed my dear and by that time i am fallen into sweet sleep or perhaps a sweet dream which is better and better sir john will come home roaring drunk and be overjoyed he finds me in a condition to be disturbed oh you need not fear him he's in for all night the servants say he's gone to drink with my lord rake nay tis not very likely indeed such suitable company should part presently what hogs men turn belinda when they grow weary of women and what owls they are whilst they are fond of em but that we may forgive well enough because they are so upon our accounts we ought to do so indeed but tis a hard matter for when a man is really in love he looks so unsufferably silly that though a woman liked him well enough before she has then much ado to endure the sight of him and this i take to be the reason why lovers are so generally ill-used well i own now i'm well enough pleased to see a man look like an ass for me ay i'm pleased he should look like an ass too that is i'm pleased with myself for making him look so nay truly i think if he'd find some other way to express his passion twould be more to his advantage yes for then a woman might like his passion and him too yet belinda after all a woman's life would be but a dull business if it were not for men and men that can look like asses too we should never blame fate for the shortness of our days our time would hang wretchedly upon our hands why truly they do help us off with a good share on it for were there no men in the world oh my conscience i should be no longer addressing than a saying my prayers nay though it were sunday for you know that one may go to church without stays on but don't you think emulation might do something for every woman you see desires to be finer than her neighbour that's only that the men may like her better than her neighbour no if there were no men adieu fine petticoats we should be weary of wearing em and adieu plays we should be weary of seeing em adieu hyde park the dust would choke us adieu st james walking would tire us adieu london the smoke would stifle us 
and a Jew going to church, for religion would ne'er prevail with us. <laughs> Our confession is so very hearty. Sure we merit absolution. Not unless we go through with it and confess all. So, Privy, for the ease of our consciences, let's hide nothing. Agreed. Why, then, I confess that I love to sit in the forefront of a box, for if one sits behind, there's two acts gone, perhaps, before one's found out, and when I am there, if I perceive the men whispering and looking upon me, you must know I cannot for my life forbear thinking that they talk to my advantage, and that sets a thousand little tickling vanities on foot. Just my case for all the world, but go on. I watch with impatience for the next jest in the play, that I might laugh and show my white teeth. If the poet has been dull, and the jest be long a-coming, I pretend to whisper one to my friend, and from thence fall into a little small discourse in which I take occasion to show my face in all humors, brisk, pleased, serious, melancholy, languishing. Not that what we say to one another causes any of these alterations, but... Don't trouble yourself to explain, for if I'm not mistaken, you and I have had some of these necessary dialogues before now, with the same intention. Why, I swear, Belinda, some people do give strange, agreeable airs to their faces in speaking. Tell me true. Did you never practice in the glass? Why, did you? Yes, if faith, many a time. And I, too, I own it both how to speak myself and how to look when others speak, but my glass and I could never yet agree what face I should make when they come blunt out with a nasty thing in a play. For all the men presently look upon the women, that's certain, so laugh we must not, though our stays burst for it, because that's telling truth and owning we understand the jest, and to look serious is so dull when the whole house is laughing." Besides that looking serious does really betray our knowledge in the matter, as much as laughing with the company would do, for if we did not understand the thing, we should naturally do like other people. For my part, I always take that occasion to blow my nose. You must blow your nose half off, then, at some plays. Why don't some reformer or other be at the poet for it? because he is not so sure of our private approbation as of our public thanks. Well, sure, there is not upon earth so impertinent a thing as women's modesty. Yes, men's fantasca that obliges us to it. If we quit our modesty, they say we lose our charms, and yet they know that very modesty is affectation and rail at our hypocrisy. Thus one would think twere a hard matter to please him, niece. Yet our kind mother nature has given us something that makes amends for all. Let our weakness be what it will. Mankind will still be weaker, and whilst there is a world, tis woman that will govern it. But prithee, one word of poor Constant before we go to bed— if it be but to furnish matter for dreams. I dare swear he's talking of me now, or thinking of me at least, though it be in the middle of his prayers. So he ought, I think, for you were pleased to make him a good round advance today, madam. Why, I have e'en plagued him enough to satisfy any reasonable woman. He has besieged me these two years to no purpose. And if he besieged you two years more, he'd be well enough paid, so he had the plundering of you at last. That may be. But I'm afraid the town won't be able to hold out much longer. For to confess the truth to you, Belinda, the garrison begins to grow mutinous. Then the sooner you capitulate, the better. Yet. Methinks I would fain stay a little longer to see you fix too, 
that we might start together and see who could love longest. What think you if Heartfree should have a month's mind to you? Why, Faith, I could almost be in love with him for despising that foolish, affected Lady Fanciful, but I'm afraid he's too cold ever to warm himself by my fire. Then he deserves to be froze to death. Would I were a man for your sake, dear rogue. Kissing her. You'd wish yourself a woman again for your own, or the men are mistaken. But if I could make a conquest of this son of Bacchus and rival his bottle, what should I do with him? He has no fortune. I can't marry him. And sure you would not have me commit fornication. Why, if you did, child, twould be but a good friendly part. It twere only to keep me in countenance whilst I commit... You know what? Well, if I can't resolve to serve you that way, I may perhaps some other as much to your satisfaction. But pray, how shall we contrive to see these blades again quickly? We must e'en have recourse to the old way. Make em an appointment twixt jest and earnest. Twill look like a frolic. And that you know's a very good thing to save a woman's blushes. You advise well, but where shall it be? In Spring Garden. But they shan't know their women till their women pull off their masks. For a surprise is the most agreeable thing in the world. And I find myself in a very good humor, ready to do em any good turn I can think on. Then pray, write them the necessary billet without farther delay. Let's go into your chamber, then, and whilst you say your prayers, I'll do it, child. Exuant. End of Act Three. Act Four of The Provoked Wife, a comedy by John Van Brew. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene, Covent Garden. Enter Lord Rake, Sir John, etc., with swords drawn. Is the dog dead? No, damn him, I heard him wheeze. How the witch's wife howled. Aye, she'll alarm the watch presently. Appear, knight, then. Come, you have a good cause to fight for. There's a man murdered. Is there? Then let his ghost be satisfied, for I'll sacrifice a constable to it presently, and burn his body upon his wooden chair. Enter a tailor with a bundle under his arm. Ah, oh, now, what have we got here? A thief? No, and to please you, I'm no thief. That we'll see presently. Here, let the general examine him. Ay, ay, let me examine him. And I'll lay a hundred pounds I find him guilty in spite of his teeth. For he looks like a sneaking rascal. Come, sirrah. Without equivocation or mental reservation, tell me of what opinion you are, and what calling, for by them I shall guess your morals. And please you, I'm a dissenting journeyman woman's tailor. Then, sirrah, you love lying by your religion, and theft by your trade. And so... That your punishment may be suitable to your crimes, I'll have you first gagged, and then hanged. Pray, good worthy gentleman, don't abuse me. Indeed, I'm an honest man, and a good workman, though I say it that should not say it. No word, sirrah, but attend to your fate. Let me see what's in that bundle. And please you, it's my lady's short cloak and sack. What lady, you reptile, you? 
My lady brute, and please your honour. My lady brute, my wife, the robe of my wife. With reverence let me approach it. The dear angel is always taking care of me in danger, and has sent me this suit of armour to protect me in this day of battle. On they go. O oh, brave, brave knight. knight! Long live Don Quixote the second! Sancho, my squire, help me on with my armour. Oh, dear gentlemen, I shall be quite undone if you take the sack. Retire, sirrah, and since you carry off your skin, go home and be happy. I think I'd e'en as good follow the gentleman's advice, for if I dispute any longer, who knows but the whim may take him to case me. These courtiers are fuller of tricks than they are of money. They'll sooner break a man's bones than pay his bill. Exit, Taylor. So, how'd you like my shapes now? To a miracle. He looks like a queen of the Amazons. But to your arms, gentlemen. The enemy's upon their march. Here's the watch. Oons, if it were Alexander the Great at the head of his army, I would drive him into a horse-pond. Huzzah! Huzzah! Oh, oh, brave, brave knight. knight! Enter watchman. See, here he comes, with all his Greeks about him. Follow me, boys. Heyday, who have we got here? Stand. Mayhap not. What are you all doing in the streets at this time of night? And who are you, madam, that seem to be at the head of this noble crew? Sirrah, I am Bonduka, queen of the Welshmen, and with a leek as long as my pedigree. <laughs> I will destroy your Roman legion in an instant. Britons, strike home. They fight off. Watchmen return with Sir John. So, we have got the Queen, however. We'll make her pay well for her ransom. Come, madam, will your majesty please to walk before the constable? The constable's a rascal, and you are the son of a whore. A most noble reply, truly. If this be her royal style, I'll warrant her maids of honor proud prettily. But we'll teach you some of our court dialect before we part with you, princess. Away with her to the roundhouse. Hands off, you ruffians. My honor is dearer to me than my life. I hope you won't be uncivil. Away with her. Exuant. Scene. A bedchamber. Enter Hartfree. Solace. What the plague ails me? Love? No. I thank you for that. My heart's rock still. Yet tis Belinda that disturbs me. That's positive. Well, what of all that? Must I love her? for being troublesome? At that rate, I might love all the women I meet. Gad! But hold! Though I don't love her for disturbing me, yet she may disturb me because I love her. Ah! That may be. Faith! I have dreamt of her. That's certain. Well, so I have of my mother. Therefore, What's that to the purpose? Ay, but Belinda runs in my mind waking, and so does many a damned thing that I don't care a farthing for. Methinks, though, I would fain be talking to her, yet I have no business. Well, am I the first man that has had a mind to do an impertinent thing? Enter Constant. How now, heart free? What makes you up and dressed so soon? I thought none but lovers quarrelled with their beds. 
I expected to have found you snoring as I used to do. My faith, friend, tis the care I have of your affairs that makes me so thoughtful. I have been studying all night how to bring your matter about with Belinda. With Belinda? With my lady, I mean. And faith, I've mighty hopes, aunt. Sure, you must be very well satisfied with her behavior to you yesterday. So well that nothing but a lover's fears can make me doubt of success. But what can this sudden change proceed from? Why, you saw her husband beat her, did you not? That's true. A husband is scarce to be born upon any terms, much less when he fights with his wife. Methinks she should e'en have cuckolded him upon the very spot to show that after the battle she was master of the field. A council of war of women would infallibly have advised her to it. But I confess, so agreeable a woman as Belinda deserves better usage. Belinda again? My lady, I mean, what a pox makes me blunder so today? Aside. A plague of this treacherous tongue. Prithee, look upon me seriously, heart free. Now, answer me directly. Is it my lady or Belinda employs your careful thoughts thus? My lady or Belinda? In love? By this light? In love? In love. Nay, ne'er deny it, for thou'lt do it so awkwardly. Twill but make the jest sit heavier about thee. My dear friend, I give thee much joy. Why, prithee, you won't persuade me to it, will you? That she's mistress of your tongue, that's plain. And I know you are so honest a fellow. Your tongue and heart always go together. But how? But how the devil? Fa! Ha! 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 Hey, day! Why, sure you don't believe it in earnest? Yes, I do, because I see you deny it in jest. Nay, but look, you, Ned. A eh? deny in jest? A uh, gadzooks, you know, I say, a, a, when a man denies a thing in jest, a... Fa, ha, 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 ha. Nay, then we shall have it. What because a man stumbles at a word? Did you never make a blunder? Yes, for I am in love. I own it. Then so am I. Now laugh till thy soul's glutted with mirth. Embracing him. But dear Constant, don't tell the town on it. Nay, then, twere almost pity to laugh at thee after so honest a confession. But tell us a little, Jack, by what new invented arms has this mighty stroke been given? Even by that unaccountable weapon called... Je ne sais quoi, for every thing that can come within the verge of beauty, I have seen it with indifference. So, in few words, then, the je ne sais quoi has been too hard for the quilted petticoat. Egad, I think the je ne sais quoi is in the quilted petticoat, at least tis certain, and ne'er think on without it, eh? Je ne sais quoi in every part about me. Well, but have all your remedies lost their virtue? Have you turned her inside out yet? I dare not so much as think on it. But don't the two years' fatigue I have had discourage you? Yes, I dread what I foresee. It cannot quit the enterprise. Like some soldiers, whose courage dwells more in their honor, than their nature. On they go, though the body trembles at what the soul makes it undertake. Nay, if you expect your mistress will use you 
as your profanations against her sex deserve, you tremble justly. But how do you intend to proceed, friend? Thou knowst I'm but a novice. Be friendly and advise me. Why, look you then, I'd have you serenade and uh, write a song. Go to church, look like a fool. Be very officious, ogle, write and lead out. And who knows, but in a year or two's time, you may be called a troublesome puppy and sent about your business. That's hard. Yet thus it oft falls out with lovers, sir. Pox on me for making one of the number. Have a care. Say no saucy things, twill but augment your crime. And if your mistress hears on't, increase your punishment. Prithee, say something then to encourage me. You know I helped you in your distress. Why, then, to encourage you to perseverance, though you may be thoroughly ill-used for your offences, I'll put you in mind that even the coyest ladies of them are all made up of desires, as well as we, and though they do hold out a long time, they will capitulate at last, for that thundering engineer, nature, does make such havoc in the town. They must surrender at long run, or perish in their own flames. Enter a footman. Sir, there's a porter without with a letter. He desires to give it into your own hands. Call him in. Enter porter. What? Joe, is it thee? And please you, sir, I was ordered to deliver this into your own hands by two well-shaped ladies at the new exchange. I was at your honour's lodgings, and your servants sent me hither. Tis well. Are you to carry any answer? No, my noble master. They gave me my orders, and whip they were gone. Like a maiden at fifteen. Very well, there. Gives him money. God bless your honour. Exit Porter. Now, let's see what honest, trusty Joe has brought us. Reads. If you and your playfellow can spare time from your business and devotions, don't fail to be at Spring Garden about eight in the evening. You'll find nothing there but women, so you need bring no other arms than what you usually carry about you. So, playfellow, here's something to stay your stomach till your mistress's dish is ready for you. Some of our old battered acquaintance. I won't go, not I. Nay, that you can't avoid. There's honour in the case. "'Tis a challenge, and I want a second. "'I doubt I shall be but a very useless one to you, "'for I'm so disheartened by this wound Belinda has given me. "'I don't think I shall have courage enough to draw my sword.' "'Oh, if that be all, come along. "'I'll warrant you find sword enough for such enemies "'as we have to deal with all.' Exuent. Scene, a street. Enter constable and watchman with Sir John. Come, Falsoof, come along if you please. I once in compassion thought to have seen you safe home this morning, but you have been so rampant and abusive all night. I shall see what the Justice of Peace will say to you. And you shall see what I'll say to the Justice of Peace. Watchman knocks at the door. Enter servant. Is Mr. Justice at home? Yes. Pray acquaint his worship. We have got an unruly woman here, and desire to know what he'll please to have done with her. I'll acquaint my master. Exit servant. Hmm. 
Mark you, constable, what cuckoldly justice is this? One that knows how to deal with such romps as you are, I'll warrant you. Enter Justice. Well, Mr. Constable, what is the matter there? And please, Your Worship, this here comical sort of gentlewoman has committed great outrages tonight. She has been frolicking with my Lord Rake and his gang. They attacked the watch, and I hear there has been a man killed. I believe tis they have done it. Sir, there may have been murder for aught I know, and tis a great mercy that there has not been a rape too. That fellow would have ravished me. Ravish, ravish, oh lord, oh lord, oh lord, ravisher. Why, please your worship, I heard Mr. Constable say he believed she was little better than a maphrodite. Why, truly she does seem a little masculine about the mouth. Yes, and about the hands too, aunt, please your worship. I did but offer in mere civility to help her up the steps to our apartment and with her gripping fist. Aye, just so, sir. Sir John knocks him down. I felled him to the ground like an ox. Out upon this boisterous woman, out upon her. Mr. Justice, he would have been uncivil. It was in defence of my honour, and I demand satisfaction. I hope your worship will satisfy her honour in Bridewell. That fist of hers will make an admirable hemp-beater. Sir, I hope you will protect me against that libidinous rascal. I am a woman of quality and virtue too, for all I am in an undress this morning. Why, she has really the air of a sort of woman, a little something out of the common. Uh, madam, if you expect I should be favourable to you, I desire I may know who you are. Sir, I am anybody at your service. Lady, I desire to know your name. Sir, my name's Mary. I, but your surname, madam. Sir, my surname's the very same with my husband's. <laughs> A strange woman this. Who is your husband, pray? Sir John. Sir John who? Sir John Brute. Is it possible, madam, you can be my Lady Brute? That happy woman, sir, I am. Only a little in my merriment to-night. I am concerned for Sir John. Truly, so am I. I have heard he is an honest gentleman. Has ever drank? Good lack. Indeed, lady, I am sorry he has such a wife. Oh, I am sorry he has any wife at all. And so perhaps may he. I doubt you have not given him a very good taste of matrimony. Taste, sir. Sir, I have scorned to stint him to a taste. I have given him a full meal of it. Indeed, I believe so. But pray, fair lady, may he have given you any occasion for this extraordinary conduct? Does he not use you well? A little upon the rough sometimes. I... Any man may be out of humour now and then. Sir, I love peace and quiet, and when a woman don't find that at home, she's apt sometimes to comfort herself with a few innocent diversions abroad. I doubt he uses you but too well. Pray, how does he as to that weighty thing, money? Does he allow you what is proper of that? Sir, I have generally enough to pay the reckoning, 
if this son of a whore of a drawer would but bring me his bill a strange woman this uh, does he spend a reasonable portion of his time at home to the comfort of his wife and children he never gave his wife cause to repine at his being abroad in his life pray madam how may he be in the grand matrimonial point is he true to your bed chaste Oons, this fellow asks so many impertinent questions egad i believe it is the justice's wife in the justice's clothes tis a great pity that he should have thus disposed of pray madam and then i've done what may be your ladyship's common method of life if i may presume so far why sir much that of a woman of quality pray how may you generally pass your time madam your mourning for example sir like a woman of quality i wake about two o'clock in the afternoon i stretch and make a sign for my chocolates when i have drank three cups i slide down again upon my back with my arms over my head while my two maids put on my stockings then hanging upon their shoulders i am trailed to my great chair where i sit and yawn for my breakfast if it don't come presently i lie down upon my couch and say my prayers while my maid reads me the playbills very well madam when the tea is brought in i drink twelve regular dishes with eight slices of bread and butter and half an hour after i send to the cook to know if the dinner is almost ready so madam by that time my head is half dressed i hear my husband swearing himself into a state of perdition that the meat's all cold upon the table to amend which i come down in an hour more and have it sent back to the kitchen to be all dressed over again poor man when i have dined and my idle servants are presumptuously set down at their ease to do so too i call for my coach to go visit fifty dear friends of whom i hope i shall never find one at home while i shall live so there's the morning and the afternoon pretty well disposed of pray madam how do you pass your evenings like a woman of spirit sir a great spirit give me a box and dice seven's the main oon sir i set you a hundred pound why do you think women are married nowadays to sit at home and mend napkins sir we have nobler ways of passing time mercy upon us mr constable what will this age come to what will it come to indeed if such women as these are not set in the stocks sir i have a little urgent business calls upon me and therefore i desire the favour of you to bring matters to a conclusion madam if i were sure that business were not to commit more disorders i would release you none by my virtue then mr constable you may discharge her sir your very humble servant if you please to accept a bottle i thank you kindly madam but i never drink in a morning good-bye to ye good-bye to you good sir 
Exit Justice. So, now, Mr. Constable, shall you and I go pick up a whore together? No, thank you, madam. My wife's enough to satisfy any reasonable man. Sir John, aside. He 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 he. The fool is married then. Well, you won't go? Not I, truly. Then I'll go by myself, and you and your wife may be damned. Exit Sir John, constable gazing after her. Why, God a mercy, lady. Exuant. Scene, Spring Garden. Constant and Hartfree cross the stage. As they go off, enter Lady Fanciful and Mademoiselle, masked and dogging them. So, I think we are about the time appointed. Let us walk up this way. Exuant. Good. Thus far have I dogged them without being discovered. Tis infallibly some intrigue that brings them to Spring Garden. How my poor heart is torn and racked with fear and jealousy. Yet let it be anything but that flirt Belinda, and I'll try to bear it. But if it prove her, all that's woman in me shall be employed to destroy her. Exuant after Constant and Hartfree. Re-enter Constant and Hartfree, Lady Fanciful and Mademoiselle, still following at a distance. I see no females yet that have anything to say to us. I'm afraid we are bantered. I wish we were, for I'm in no humour to make either them or myself merry. Nay, I'm sure you'll make them merry enough if I tell them why you are so dull. But, prithee, why so heavy and sad before you begin to be ill-used? For the same reason, perhaps, that you are so brisk and well-pleased, because both pains and pleasures are generally more considerable in prospect than when they come to pass. Enter Lady Brute and Belinda, masked and poorly dressed. How now? Who are these? Not our game, I hope. If they are, we are even well enough served to come a-hunting here when we had so much better game in chase elsewhere. Lady Fanciful to Mademoiselle So, those are their ladies without doubt. But I am afraid the doily stuff is not worn for want of better clothes. They are the very shape and size of Belinda and her aunt. So they be indeed, madame. We'll slip into this close arbour, where we may hear all they say. Excellent Lady Fanciful and Mademoiselle. What? Are you afraid of us, gentlemen? Why, truly, I think we may, if appearance don't lie. Do you always find women what they appear to be, sir? No, forsooth. But I seldom find them better than they appear to be. Then the outside's best, you think? Tis the honestest. Have a care, Hartfree. You are relapsing again. Why, does the gentleman used to rail at women? He has done formerly. I suppose he had very good cause for it. They did not use you so well as you thought you deserved, sir. They made themselves merry at your expense, sir. Laughed when you sighed. Slept while you were waking. Had your porter beat. And threw your billet doux in the fire. Hey, day! I shall do more than rail presently. Why, you won't beat us, will you? I don't know, but I may. What the devil's coming here? Sir John in a gown. And drunk, if faith. Enter Sir John. What a pox! Here's Constant, Hartfree, and two whores he gad. Oh, you covetous rogues! What, have you never a spare punk for your friend? 
but I'll share with you. He seizes both the women. Why, what the plague have you been doing, knight? Why, I have been beating the watch and scandalizing the clergy. A very good account, truly. And what do you think I'll do next? Nay, that no man can guess. Why, if you let me sup with you, I'll treat both your strumpets. Lady Brute aside. Oh, Lord, we are undone. No, we can't sup together, because we have some affairs elsewhere. But if you'll accept of these two ladies, we'll be so complacent to you to resign our right in em. Belinda aside. Lord, what shall we do? Let me see. Their clothes are such damn clothes, they won't pawn for the reckoning. Sir John, your servant. Rapture attend you. Adieu, ladies. Make much of the gentleman. Why, sure you won't leave us in the hands of a drunken fellow to abuse us. Who do you call a drunken fellow, you slut, you? I'm a man of quality. The king has made me a knight. Hartfree runs off. Aye, aye, you are in good hands. Adieu, adieu. The devil's hands. Let me go or I'll, for heaven's sake, protect us. She breaks from him, runs to Constant, twitching off her mask and clapping it on again. I'll devil you, you jade. I'll demolish your ugly face. Hold a little, knight. She swoons. I'll swoon her. Hey, heart free. Re-enter heart free. Belinda runs to him and shows her face. Oh, heavens! My dear creature, stand there a little. Pull him off, Jack. Hold, mighty man, look ye, sir, we did but jest with you. These are ladies of our acquaintance, that we had a mind to frighten a little, but now you must leave us. Oh, I won't leave, not I. Nay, but you must, though, and therefore make no words on it. Then you are a couple of damned uncivil fellows, and I hope your punks will give you sauce to your mutton. Exit Sir John. Oh, I shall never come to myself again. I am so frightened. Twas a narrow scape, indeed. Women must have frolics, you see, whatever they cost them. This might have proved a dear one, though. You are the more obliged to us for the risk we run upon your accounts. And I hope you'll acknowledge something due to our knight errantry, ladies. This is the second time we have delivered you. Tis true. And since we see fate has designed you for our guardians, twill make us the more willing to trust ourselves in your hands. But you must not have the worse opinion of us for our innocent frolic. Ladies, you may command our opinions in everything that is to your advantage. Then, sir, I command you to be of opinion that women are sometimes better than they appear to be. Lady Brute and Constant talk apart. Madam, you have made a convert of me in everything. I'm grown a fool. I could be fond of a woman. I thank you, sir, in the name of the whole sex. Which sex nothing but yourself could ever have atoned for it. Now has my vanity a devilish itch to know in what my merit consists. In your humility, madam, that keeps you ignorant, it consists at all. One other compliment with that serious face, and I hate you forever after. Some women love to be abused. Is that it you would be at? No, not that neither. 
but I'd have men talk plainly what's fit for women to hear without putting them either to a real or an affected blush. Why, then, in as plain terms as I can find to express myself, I could love you even to matrimony itself, almost to God. Just as Sir John did her ladyship there. What think you? Don't you believe one month's time might bring you down to the same indifference, only clad in a little better manners, perhaps? Well, you men are unaccountable things, mad till you have your mistresses, and then stark mad till you're rid of them again. Tell me honestly, is not your patience put to a much severe trial after possession than before? With a great many, I must confess it is, to our eternal scandal. But I, dear creature... Do but try me. That's the surest way indeed to know, but not the safest. To Lady Brute. Madam, are you not for taking a turn in the great walk? It's almost dark. Nobody will know us. Really, I find myself something idle, Belinda. Besides, I dote upon this little odd private corner. But don't let my lazy fancy confine you. Constant aside. So, she would be left alone with me. That's well. Well, we'll take one turn and come to you again. Too heart free. Come, sir, shall we go pry into the secrets of the garden? Who knows what discoveries we may make? Madam, I'm at your service. Constant to heart free aside. Don't make too much haste back, for, do you hear, I may be busy. Enough. Excellent, Belinda and Hartfrey. Sure you think me scandalously free, Mr. Constant. I am afraid I shall lose your good opinion of me. My good opinion, madam, is like your cruelty, ne'er to be removed. But if I should remove my cruelty, then there's an end of your good opinion. There is not so strict an alliance between them, neither. Tis certain I should love you then better, if that be possible, than I do now. And where I love, I always esteem. Indeed. I doubt you much. Why, suppose you had a wife, and she should entertain a gallant. If I gave her just cause, how could I justly condemn her? Ah, but you differ widely about just causes. But blows can bear no dispute. Nor ill manners much, truly. Then no woman upon earth has so just a cause as you have. Oh, but a faithful wife is a beautiful character. To a deserving husband, I confess it is. But can his faults release my duty? In equity, without doubt. And where laws dispense with equity, equity should dispense with laws. Pray, let's leave this dispute. For you men have as much witchcraft in your arguments as... Women have in their eyes. But whilst you attack me with your charms, tis but reasonable I assault you with mine. The case is not the same. What mischief we do we can't help, and therefore are to be forgiven. Beauty soon obtains pardon for the pain that it gives when it applies the balm of compassion to the wound. But a fine face and a hard heart is almost as bad as an ugly face and a soft one, both very troublesome to many a poor gentleman. Yes, and to many a poor gentlewoman, too, I can assure you. But, pray, which of them is it that most afflicts you? Your glass and conscience will inform you, madam. But for heaven's sake, for now I must be serious, if pity or if gratitude can move you. Taking her hand. If constancy and truth have power to tempt you, 
if love, if adoration can affect you, give me at least some hopes that time may do what you perhaps mean never to perform. Twill ease my sufferings, though not quench my flame. Your sufferings eased, your flame would soon abate. And that I would preserve, not quench it, sir. Would you preserve it, nourish it with favours? For that's the food it naturally requires. Yet on that natural food t'would surfeit soon, Should I resolve to grant all you would ask. And in refusing all, you starve it. Forgive me, therefore, since my hunger rages, If I at least grow wild, and in my frenzy Force at least this from you. Kissing her hand. Or if you'd have my flame soar higher still, Then grant me this, and this, and thousands more. Kissing first her hand, then her neck, aside. For now's the time she melts into compassion. Lady Brute, aside. Poor coward virtue, how it shuns the battle. Oh, heavens, let me go! I go, I. Where shall we go, my charming angel? Into this private arbour? Nay, let's lose no time. Moments are precious. And lovers wild, pray let us stop here, at least for this time. Tis impossible. He that has power over you can have none over himself. As he is forcing her into the arbor, Lady Fanciful and Mademoiselle bolt out upon them and run over the stage. Ah, I'm lost! Fee, 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 fee! Fee, 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 fee! Death and furies! Who are these? Oh, heavens! I'm out of my wits! If they knew me, I am ruined. Don't be frightened! Ten thousand to one, they are strangers to you. Whatever they are, I won't stay here a moment longer. Whither will you go? Home, as if the devil were in me. Lord, where's this Belinda now? Enter Belinda and Harpfree. Oh, tis well you are come. I'm so frightened my hair stands an end. Let's be gone, for heaven's sake. Lord, what's the matter? The devil's the matter. We are discovered. Here's a couple of women have done the most impertinent thing. Away, 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 away. Exit running. Re-enter Lady Fanciful and Mademoiselle. Well, Mademoiselle. "'Tis a prodigious thing how women can suffer filthy fellows to grow so familiar with them." "'Ah, madame, il n'y a rien de si naturel.' "'Fé, fé, fé! But, oh, my heart, oh, jealousy, oh, torture, I'm upon the rack. What shall I do? My lover's lost, I ne'er shall see him mine.' Pausing. But I may be revenged, and that's the same thing. Ah, sweet revenge, thou welcome thought, thou healing balsam to my wounded soul. Be but propitious on this one occasion. I'll place my heaven in thee for all my life to come. To woman how indulgent nature's kind, No blast of fortune long disturbs her mind. Compliance to her fate supports her still. If love won't make her happy, mischief will. Exuant. End of Act Four. Act Five. 
of The Provoked Wife, a comedy by John Van Brooke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 5. Scene. Lady Fanciful's House. Enter Lady Fanciful and Mademoiselle. Well, Mademoiselle, did you dog the filthy things? Oh, que oui, madame. And where are they? Au logis. What? Men and all? Tous ensemble. Oh, confidence. What, carry their fellows to their own house? C'est que le mari n'y est pas. No, so I believe truly. But he shall be there, and quickly too, if I can find him out. Well, it is a prodigious thing to see when men and women get together how they fortify one another in their impudence. But if that drunken fool, her husband, he to be found ere in a tavern in town, I'll send him amongst them. I'll spoil their sport. En vérité, madame, ce serait dommage. Tis in vain to oppose it, mademoiselle. Therefore, never go about it. For I am the steadiest creature in the world when I have determined to do mischief. So come along. Exuant. Scene. Sir John Brute's house. Enter Constant, Hartfree, Lady Brute, Belinda, and Lovewell. Are you sure you don't mistake, Lovewell? Madam, I saw them all go into the tavern together, and my master was so drunk he could scarce stand. Then, gentlemen, I believe we may venture to let you stay and play at cards with us an hour or two, for they'll scarce part till morning. I think tis pity they should ever part. The company that's here, madam. Then, sir, the company that's here must remember to part itself in time. Madam, we don't intend to forfeit your future favours by an indiscreet usage of this. The moment you give us the signal, we shan't fail to make our retreat. Upon those conditions, then, let us sit down to cards. Enter Lovewell. Oh, Lord, madam, here's my master just staggering in upon you. He has been quarrelsome yonder, and they have kicked him out of the company. Into the closet, gentlemen, for heaven's sake. I'll wheedle him to bed, if possible. Constant and Hartfree run into the closet. Enter Sir John, all dirt and bloody. Uh, oh, he's all over blood. What the plague does the woman... Squall for. Did you never see a man in pickle before? Lord, where have you been? Oh, I have been at <coughs> cuffs. I fear that is not all. I hope you are not wounded. Sound as a roach, wife. I'm mighty glad to hear it. You know, I think you lie. You do me wrong to think so. For heaven's my witness, I had rather see my own blood trickle down than yours. Then will I be crucified. Tis a hard fate I should not be believed. Tis a damned atheistical age, wife. I am sure I have given you a thousand tender proofs how great my care is of you. But, spite of all your cruel thoughts, I'll still persist, and at this moment, if I can, persuade you to lie down and sleep a little. Why, you think I'm drunk, you slut, you... Heaven forbid I should, but I'm afraid you are feverish. Pray, let me feel your pulse. Stand off and be damned. Why, I see your distemper in your very eyes. You are all on fire. Pray, go to bed. Let me entreat you. Come, kiss me then. Lady Brute kissing him. There. Now go. Aside. 
He stinks like poison. I see it goes damnably against your stomach. And therefore, kiss me again. Nay, now you fool me. Do it, I say. Lady Brute, aside. Ah, Lord, have mercy upon me. Well, there. Now will you go? Now, wife, you shall see my gratitude. You gave me two kisses. I'll give you two hundred. Kisses and tumbles her. Oh, Lord! Pray, Sir John, be quiet. Heavens, what a pickle am I in! Belinda, aside. If I were in her pickle, I'd call my gallant out of the closet, and he should cudgel him soundly. So, now you being as dirty and as nasty as myself, we may go pig together. But first I must have a cup of your cold tea, wife. Going to the closet. Oh, I am ruined. There's none there, my dear. I warrant you all find some, my dear. You can't open the door. The lock's spoiled. I have been turning and turning the key this half hour to no purpose. I'll send for the smith tomorrow. There's ne'er a smith in Europe can open a door with more expedition than I can do. As for example, Pooh! He bursts open the door with his foot. Oh, now, what the devil have we got here? Constant, heart free, and two whores again, egad. This is the worst cold tea <laughs> that ever I met with in my life. Enter Constant and Heartfree, Lady Brute aside. Oh, Lord, what will become of us? Gentlemen, I am your very humble servant. I give you many thanks. I see you take care of my family. I shall do all I can to return the obligation. Sir, how oddly soever this business may appear to you, you would have no cause to be uneasy if you knew the truth of all things. Your lady is the most virtuous woman in the world, and nothing has passed but an innocent frolic. Nothing else, upon my honour, sir. You are both very civil gentlemen, and my wife there is a very civil gentlewoman. Therefore, I don't doubt but many civil things have passed between you. Your very humble servant. Lady Brute, aside to Constant. Pray, be gone. He's so drunk he can't hurt us tonight. And tomorrow morning you shall hear from us. I'll obey you, madam. Sir, when you are cool... You'll understand reason better. So then, I shall take the pains to inform you. If not, I wear a sword, sir, and so good-bye to ye. Come along, heart-free. Exit. Wear a sword, sir. And what of all that, sir? He comes to my house, eats my meat, lies with my wife, dishonours my family, gets a bastard to inherit my estate. And when I ask a civil account of all this, Sir, he says, I wear a sword. 
wear a sword sir yes sir says he i wear a sword it may be a good answer at cross purposes but it is a damn one to a man in my whimsical circumstance sir says he i wear a sword to lady brute and what do you wear now ah huh? tell me sitting down in a great chair what you are modest and can't why then i'll tell you you slut you you wear an impudent lewd face a damn designing heart and a tail and a tail full of he falls fast asleep snoring so thanks to kind heaven he's fast for some hours tis well he is so that we may have time to lay our story handsomely for we must lie like the devil to bring ourselves off what shall we say belinda belinda musing i'll tell you it must be all light upon heart free and i will say he has courted me some time but for reasons unknown to us has ever been very earnest the thing might be kept from sir john that therefore hearing him upon the stairs he ran into the closet though against our will and constant with him to prevent jealousy and to give this a good impudent face of truth that i may deliver you from the trouble you are in i'll even if he pleases marry him i'm beholden to you cousin but that would be carrying the jest a little too far for your own sake you know he's a younger brother and has nothing tis true but i like him and have fortune enough to keep above extremity i can't say i would live with him in a cell upon love and bread and butter but i had rather have the man i love and a middle state of life than that gentleman in the chair there and twice your ladyship's splendour in truth niece you are in the right on it for i am very uneasy with my ambition but perhaps had i married as you'll do i might have been as ill-used some risk i do confess there always is but if a man has the least spark either of honour or good nature he can never use a woman ill that loves him and makes his fortune both yet i must own to you some little struggling i still have with this teasing ambition of ours for pride you know is as natural to a woman as to a saint i can't help being fond of this rogue and yet it goes to my heart to think i must never whisk to hyde park with above a pair of horses have no coronet upon my coach nor a page to carry up my train but above all that business of place well taking a place is a noble prerogative especially after a quarrel or of a rival but pray say no more on it for fear i change my mind for oh my conscience were not for your affair in the balance i should go near to pick up some odious man of quality yet and only take poor heart free for a gallant then him you must have however things go yes why we may pretend what we will but tis a hard matter to live without the man we love especially when we are married to the man we hate pray tell me do the men of the town ever believe us virtuous when they see us do so oh no nor indeed hardly let us do what we will the most of them think there is no such thing as virtue considered in the strictest notions of it and therefore when you hear em say such a one is a woman of reputation they only mean she is a woman of discretion for they consider we have no more religion than they have nor so much morality 
and between you and I, Belinda, I'm afraid the want of inclination seldom protects any of us. But what think you of the fear of being found out? I think that never kept any woman virtuous long. We are not such cowards neither. No, let us once pass fifteen, and we have too good an opinion of our own cunning to believe the world can penetrate into what we would keep a secret. And so, in short, we cannot reasonably blame the men for judging of us by themselves. But sure we are not so wicked as they are, after all. We are as wicked, child, but our vice lies another way. Men have more courage than we, so they commit more bold, impudent sins. They quarrel, fight, swear, drink, blaspheme, and the like. Whereas we, being cowards, only backbite, tell lies, cheat at cards, and so forth. But tis late. Let's end our discourse for tonight, and, out of an excess of charity, take a small care of that nasty, drunken thing there. Do but look at him, Belinda. Ah, tis a savory dish. As savory as tis, I'm cloyed with it. Prithee, call the butler to take it away. Call the butler. Call the scavenger. To a servant within. Who's there? Call Razor. Let him take away his master, scour him clean with a little soap and sand, and so put him to bed. Come, Belinda, I'll e'en lie with you tonight, and in the morning we'll send for our gentlemen to set this matter even. With all my heart. Good night, my dear. Making a low curtsy to Sir John. Both. <laughs> <laughs> Exuant. Enter Razor. My lady, there's a wag. My master, there's a cuckold. Marriage is a slippery thing. Women have depraved appetites. My lady is a wag. I have heard all. I have seen all. I understand all, and I'll tell all. For my little French woman loves news dearly. The story will gain her heart, or nothing will. To his master. Come, sir, your head's too full of fumes at present to make room for your jealousy. But I reckon we shall have rare work with you when your pate's empty. Come to your kennel, you cuckoldy drunken sot, you. Carries him out upon his back. Scene, Lady Fanciful's house. Enter Lady Fanciful and Mademoiselle. But why did you not tell me before, mademoiselle, that Razor and you were found? De modestie hinder me, madame. Why, truly, modesty does often hinder us from doing things we have an extravagant mind to. But does he love you well enough yet to do anything you bid him? Do you think to oblige you? He would speak scandal. Madame, to oblige your ladyship, he shall speak blasphemy. Why then, mademoiselle, I'll tell you what you shall do. You shall engage him to tell his master all that passed at Spring Garden. I have a mind he should know what a wife and a niece he has got. Il le fera, madame. Enter a footman, who speaks to Mademoiselle apart. Mademoiselle, yonder Mr. Razor desires to speak with you. Tell him I come presently. Exit, footman. Razor be there, madame. That's fortunate. Well, I'll leave you together. And if you find him stubborn, Mademoiselle, hark you, don't refuse him... A few little reasonable liberties to put him into humour. Laissez-moi faire. Exit Lady Fanciful. Razor peeps in, and seeing Lady Fanciful gone, runs to Mademoiselle, takes her about the neck, and kisses her. How 
now, confidence? How now, modesty? Who make you so familiar, sirrah? My impudence, hussy. Stand off, rogue face. Ah, mademoiselle, great news at our house. Why, what be the matter? Uh, the matter? Why, up tales, all's the matter. Tu te moques de moi. Now do you long to know the particulars, the time when, the place where, the manner how? But I don't tell you a word more. Nay, didn't thou kill me, Razor? Come kiss me, then. Clapping his hands behind him. Nay, pretty, tell me. Good-bye to ye. Going. Old, old, I will kiss thee. Kissing him. Uh, so that's civil. Why now, my pretty Paul, uh, my goldfinch, uh, my little water wagtail, you must know that. Ah, uh, oh, come, kiss me again. I won't kiss thee no more. Goodbye to ye. Going. Doucement. There. Es tu content? Kissing him. So. Now I'll tell thee all. Why, the news is that Cuckoldum in folio is duly printed, and Matrimony in quarto is just going into the press. Will you buy any books, mademoiselle? Tu parles comme un libraire. The devil no understand thee. Why, then, that I may make myself intelligible to a waiting woman, I'll speak like a valet de chambre. My lady has cuckolded my master. Bon which we take very ill from her hands, I can tell her that. We can't yet prove matter-of-fact upon her. N'importe. But we can prove that matter-of-fact had like to have been upon her. Oui, da. For we have such bloody circumstances. Sans doute. That any man of parts may draw tickling conclusions from him. Fort bien. We found a couple of tight, well-built gentlemen stuffed into her ladyship's closet. Le diable! And I, in my particular person, have discovered a most damnable plot, how to persuade my poor master that all his hide-and-seek, this will in the wisp, has no other meaning than a Christian marriage for sweet Mrs. Belinda. Un mariage? Oh, les drôles! Don't you interrupt me, hussy. Tis agreed, I say. And my innocent lady, to wriggle herself out at the back door of the business, turns marriage bawd to her niece, and resolves to deliver up her fair body to be tumbled and mumbled by that young licorice whipster, heart free. Now, are you satisfied? No. Right, woman. Always gaping for more. This be all, then, that thou know? All? Aye, and a great deal, too, I think. Thou be fool, thou know nothing. Écoute, mon pauvre razor. Thou seest these two eyes? These two eyes have seen the devil. The woman's mad. In spring garden, that rogue constant meet thy lady. Bon. I'll tell thee no more. Nay, prithee, my swan. Come, kiss me, then. Clapping her hands behind her as he did before. I won't kiss you, not I. Adieu. Going. Hold. Uh, now, now proceed. Gives her a hearty kiss. Ah, sa. I hide myself in one cunning place where I hear all and see all. First, thy drunken master come mal a propos, but the soul not know his own dear wife, so he leave her to her sport. Then the game begin. The lover say soft thing. The lady look upon the ground. As she speaks, Razor still acts the man and she the woman. He take her by the hand. She turn her head on other way. Then he squeeze very hard. Then she pull very softly. Then he take her in his arm. Then she give him little pet. Then he kiss her teton. Then she say, P 
pish ne si then he tremble then she sigh then he pull her into the arbor then she pinch him ay but not so hard you baggage you then he grow bold she grow weak he throw her down il tombe dessus le diable assiste il emporte tout razor struggles with her as if he would throw her down stand off sirrah you have set me afire you jade you then go to the river and quench thyself what an unnatural harlot tis razor looking languishingly on him mademoiselle thou not love me not love thee more than a frenchman does soup then thou wilt refuse nothing that i bid thee don't bid me be damned then no only tell thy master all i have tell thee of thy lady why you little malicious trumpet you should you like to be served so thou dispute then adieu hold but why wilt thou make me such a rogue my dear voilà un vrai anglais il est amoureux et cependant il veut raisonner va t'en au diable hold once more in hopes thou'lt give me up thy body i resign thee my soul bon écoute donc if thou fail me i never see thee more if thou obey me je m'abandonne à toi she takes him about the neck and gives him a smacking kiss exit mademoiselle razor licking his lips not to be a rogue a more vincent omnia exit razor enter lady fanciful and mademoiselle marry say ye will the two things marry on va le faire madame look you mademoiselle in short i can't bear it no i find i can't for once i see em in bed together i shall have ten thousand thoughts in my head will make me run distracted therefore run and call raise or back immediately for something must be done to stop this impertinent wedding if i can but defer it four and twenty hours i'll make such a work about town with that little pert slut's reputation he shall as soon as marry a witch mademoiselle aside la voilà bien intentionnée excuant scene constance lodgings enter constant and hartfree but what dost think will become of this business tis easier to think but will not come on it what's that a challenge i know the knight too well for that his dear body will always prevail upon his noble soul to be quiet but though he dare not challenge me perhaps he may venture to challenge his wife not if you whisper him in the ear you won't have him do it and there's no other way left that i see for as drunk as he was he'll remember you and i were where we should not be and i don't think him quite blackhead enough yet to be persuaded we were got into his wife's closet only to peep into her prayer book enter a servant with a letter sir here's a letter a porter brought it oh ho here's instructions for us reads the accident that has happened has touched our invention to the quick we would fain come off without your help but find that's impossible in a word the whole business must be thrown upon a matrimonial intrigue between your friend and mine but if the parties are not fond enough to go quite through with the matter tis sufficient for our turn they own the design we'll find pretences enough to break the match adieu well woman for invention how long would my blockhead have been producing this hey hartfree what musing man prithee be cheerful 
What sayest thou, friend, to this matrimonial remedy? Why, I say, tis worse than the disease. Here's a fellow for you. There's beauty and money on her side, and love up to the ears on his, and yet— And yet I think I may reasonably be allowed to boggle at marrying the niece, in the very moment that you are debauching the aunt. Why, truly, there may be something in that, but have not you a good opinion enough of your own parts— to believe you could keep a wife to yourself? I should have, if I had a good opinion enough of hers, to believe she could do as much by me. For to do em right, after all, the wife seldom rambles till the husband shows her the way. Tis true, a man of real worth scarce ever is a cuckold, but by his own fault. Women are not naturally lewd, there must be something to urge em to it. They'll cook old a churl out of revenge, a fool because they despise him, a beast because they loathe him. But when they make bold with a man they once had a well-grounded value for, tis because they first see themselves neglected by him. Nay, were I well assured that I should never grow, Sir John, I never should fear Belinda would play my lady, but our weakness, thou knowest, my friend, consists in that very change we so impudently throw upon, indeed, a steadier and more generous sex. Why, faith, we are a little impudent in that matter, that's the truth, aunt, but this is wonderful, to see you grown so warm an advocate for those whom, but t'other day, you took so much pains to abuse. All revolutions run into extremes. The bigot makes the boldest atheist, and the coyest saint, the most extravagant strumpet. But prithee, advise me in this good and evil, this life and death, this blessing and cursing that's set before me. Shall I marry, or die a maid? Why, faith, heart-free, matrimony is like an army going to engage, loves the forlorn hope which is soon cut off, the marriage knot is the main body which may stand buff a long, long time, and repentance is the rear-guard, which rarely gives ground, as long as the main body has a being. Conclusion, then, you advise me to whore on as you do. That's not concluded yet, for though marriage be a lottery, in which there are a wondrous many blanks, yet there is one inestimable lot, in which the only heaven on earth is written. Would your kind fate but guide your hand to that, though I were wrapped in all that luxury could itself clothe me with, I still should envy you. And justly, too, for to be capable of loving one, doubtless, is better than to possess a thousand. But how far that capacity's in me, alas, I know not. But you would know. I would so. Matrimony will inform you. Come, one flight of resolution carries you to the land of experience, where, in a very moderate time, you'll know the capacity of your soul and your body both, or I'm mistaken. Exuent. Scene. Sir John Brute's house. Enter Lady Brute and Belinda. Well, madam. What answer have you from em? That they'll be here this moment. I fancy it will end in a wedding. I'm sure he's a fool if it don't. Ten thousand pounds, and such a lass as you are, is no contemptible offer to a younger brother. But are not you under strange agitations? Prithee, how does your pulse beat? 
high and low. I have much ado to be valiant. Sure it must feel very strange to go to bed to a man. Um, it does feel a little odd at first, but it will soon grow easy to you. Enter Constant and Harpfree. Good morrow, gentlemen. Have you slept after your adventure? Some careful thoughts, ladies, on your accounts, have kept us waking. And some careful thoughts on your own, I believe, have hindered you from sleeping. Pray, how does this matrimonial project relish with you? Why, faith, even as storming towns does with soldiers, where the hope of delicious plunder banishes the fear of being knocked on the head. Is it then possible, after all, that you dare think of downright lawful wedlock? Madam, you have made me so foolhardy, I dare do anything. Then, sir, I challenge you, and matrimony's the spot where I expect you. Tis enough, I'll not fail. Aside. So, now I am in for Hobbes voyage, a great leap in the dark. Well, gentlemen, this matter being concluded, then, have you got your lessons ready? For Sir John is grown such an atheist of late, he'll believe nothing upon easy terms. We'll find ways to extend his faith, madam. But pray, how do you find him this morning? Most lamentably morose, chewing the cud after last night's discovery, of which... However, he had but a confused notion e'en now. But I'm afraid the valet de chambre has told him all, for they are very busy together at this moment. When I told him of Belinda's marriage, I had no other answer but a grunt, from which you may draw what conclusions you think fit. But to your notes, gentlemen, he's here. Enter Sir John and Razor. Good morrow, sir. Good morrow, Sir John. I'm very sorry my indiscretion should cause so much disorder in your family. Disorders generally come from indiscretion, sir. She's no strange thing at all. I hope, my dear, you are satisfied there was no wrong intended you. None, my dove. If not, I hope my consent to marry Mr. Hartfree will convince you. For as little as I know of a more, sir, I can assure you one intrigue is enough to bring four people together without further mischief. And I know, too, that intrigues tend to procreation of more kinds than one. One increase will beget another as soon as beget a son or daughter. I am very sorry, sir, to see you still seem unsatisfied with a lady whose more than common virtue, I am sure, were she my wife, should meet a better usage. Sir, if her conduct has put a trick upon her virtue, her virtue's the bubble... But her husband's the loser. Sir, you have received a sufficient answer already to justify both her conduct and mine. You'll pardon me for meddling in your family affairs, but I perceive I am the man you are jealous of, and therefore it concerns me. Would it did not concern me? And then I should not care who it concerned. Well, sir, if truth and reason won't content you, I know but one way more, which, if you think fit, you may take. Lord, sir, you are very hasty. If I had been found at prayers in your wife's closet, I should have allowed you twice as much time to come to yourself in. Nay, sir, if time be all you want, we have no quarrel. I told you how the sword would work upon him. Sir John muses. Let him muse. However, 
I'll lay fifty pound our foreman brings us in, not guilty. Sir John aside. Tis well, tis very well. In spite of that young jade's matrimonial intrigue, I am a downright stinking cuckold. Here they are. Boo! Putting his hand to his forehead. Methinks I could butt with a bull. What the plague did I marry her for? I knew she did not like me. If she had, she would have lain with me. For I would have done so because I liked her. But that's past and I have her. And now what shall I do with her? If I put my horns into my pocket, she'll grow insolent. If I don't, that goat there, that stallion, is ready to whip me through to the guts. The debate, then, is reduced to this. Shall I die a hero, or live a rascal? Why, wiser men than I have long since concluded that a living dog is better than a dead lion. To Constant and Hartfree. Gentlemen, now my wine and my passion are governable, I must own I have never observed anything in my wife's course of life to back me in my jealousy of her. But jealousy's a mark of love. So she need not trouble her head about it, as long as I make no more words on't. Lady Fanciful enters disguised, and addresses to Belinda apart. I'm glad to see your reason rule at last. Give me your hand. I hope you'll look upon me as you are wont. Your humble servant. Aside. A wheedling son of a whore. And that I may be sure you are friends with me too, pray give me your consent to wed your niece. Sir, you have it with all my heart. Damn me if you hadn't. Aside. Tis time to get rid of her. A young pert pimp. She'll make an incomparable board in a little time. Enter a servant who gives Hartfree a letter. Hartfree, your husband, you say? Tis impossible. Would to kind heaven it were, but tis too true, and in the world there lives not such a wretch. I am young, and either I have been flattered by my friends as well as the glass, or nature has been kind and generous to me. I had a fortune, too, was greater far than he could ever hope for. But with my heart I am robbed of all the rest. I am slighted, and I am beggared of both at once. I have scarce a bare subsistence from the villain, yet dare complain to none, for he has sworn, if ever tis known I'm his wife, he'll murder me. Weeping. The traitor! I accidentally was told he courted you. Charity soon prevailed upon me to prevent your misery, and, as you see, I'm still so generous, even to him, as not to suffer he should do a thing for which the law might take away his life. Weeping. Poor creature, how I pity her! They continue talking aside, Hartfrey aside. Death and damnation! Let me read it again. Reads. Though I have a particular reason not to let you know who I am till I see you, yet you'll easily believe tis a faithful friend that gives you this advice. I have lain with Belinda. Good. I have a child by her. Better and better. Which is now at nurse. Heaven be praised. 
and I think the foundation laid for another. Ha! Oh, true penny! No rack could have tortured this story from me, but friendship has done it. I heard of your design to marry her, and could not see you abused. Make use of my advice, but keep my secret till I ask you for it again. Adieu. Exit Lady Fanciful. Constant to Belinda. Come, madam, shall we send for the parson? I doubt here's no business for the lawyer. Younger brothers have nothing to settle but their hearts, and that, I believe, my friend here has already done very faithfully. Belinda scornfully. Are you sure, sir, there are no old mortgages upon it? Hartfrey coldly. If you think there are, madam, it mayn't be amiss to defer the marriage till you are sure they are paid off. Belinda aside. How the gallant horse kicks. To Hartfrey. We'll defer it as long as you please, sir. The more time we take to consider on it, madam, the less apt we shall be to commit oversights. Therefore, if you please, we will put it off for just nine months. Guilty consciences make men cowards. I don't wonder you want time to resolve. And they make women desperate. I don't wonder why you are so quickly determined. What does the fellow mean? What does the lady mean? Zooms, what do you both mean? Hartfrey and Belinda walk chasing about. Razor aside. Here is so much sport going to be spoiled. It makes me ready to weep again. A pox of this impertinent lady fanciful, and her plots, and her French woman, too. She's a whimsical, ill natured bitch, and when I have got my bones broke in her service, tis ten to one, but my recompense is a clap. I hear them tittering without still. I cod, I'll e'en go lug them both in by the ears, and discover the plot to secure my pardon. Exit Razor. Prithee, explain, Hartfree. A fair deliverance, thank my stars and my friend. Tis well it went no farther. A base fellow. What can be the meaning of all this? What's his meaning? I don't know. But mine is that if I had married him, I had had no husband. And what's her meaning? I don't know. But mine is that if I had married her, I had had wife enough. Your people of wit have got such cramped ways of expressing themselves, they seldom comprehend one another. Pox take you both. Will you speak that you may be understood? Enter Razor in sackcloth, pulling in Lady Fanciful and Mademoiselle. If they won't, here comes an interpreter. Heavens! What have we here? A villain, but a repenting villain. Stuff which saints in all ages have been made of. Razor! Razor! What means this sudden metamorphose? Nothing without my pardon. What pardon do you want? Imprimis, your ladyships, for a damnable lie made upon your spotless virtue, and set to the tune of Spring Garden. To Sir John. Next at my generous master's feet I bend, for interrupting his more noble thoughts with phantoms of disgraceful cockledom. To Constant. Thirdly, I to this gentleman apply for making him the hero of my romance. To Hartfrey. Fourthly, your pardon, noble sir, I ask, for clandestinely marrying you, without either bidding of bands, bishop's license, friend's consent, or your own knowledge. To Belinda. And lastly, to my good young lady's clemency I come, for pretending the corn was sowed in the ground before ever the plough had been in the field. Sir John aside. So that, after all, tis a moot point. 
whether I am a cuckold or not. Well, sir, upon condition you confess all, I'll pardon you myself and try to obtain as much from the rest of the company. But I must know, then, who tis has put you upon all this mischief. Satan and his equipage. Woman tempted me, lust weakened me, and so the devil overcame me. As fell Adam, so fell I. Then pray, Mr. Adam, will you make us acquainted with your Eve? Razor to Mademoiselle. Unmask for the honor of France. Mademoiselle! Me ask ten thousand pardon of all the good company. Why, this mystery thickens instead of clearing up. To Razor. You son of a whore, you. Put us out of our pain. One moment brings sunshine. Shooing, Mademoiselle. Tis true this is the woman that tempted me, but this is the serpent that tempted the woman. And if my prayers might be heard, her punishment for so doing should be like the serpents of old. Pulls off Lady Fanciful's mask. She should lie upon her face all the days of her life. Lady, Lady Fanciful! Fanciful. Impertinent! Ridiculous! <laughs> I hope your ladyship will give me leave to wish you joy, since you have owned your marriage yourself. Too heart free. I vow to a strangely wicked in you to think of another wife when you had one already so charming as her ladyship. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Fanciful aside. Confusion sees him as it seizes me. Que le diable est tout ce moreau de résor. Your ladyship seems disordered. A breeding qualm, perhaps. Mr. Hartfree, your bottle of Hungary water to your lady. Why, madam, he stands so unconcerned, as if he were your husband in earnest. Your mirth as nauseous as yourself, Belinda. You think you triumph over a rival now. Alas, mon pauvre ville, whenever I'm a rival, there's no cause for mirth. No, my poor wretch, tis from another principle I have acted. I knew that thing there would make so perverse a husband, and you so impertinent a wife, that left your mutual plague should make you both run mad, I charitably would have broke the match. <laughs> <laughs> Exit, laughing affectedly, Mademoiselle following her. <laughs> <laughs> Sir John aside. Why now, this woman will be married to somebody too. Poor creature, what a passion she's in, but I forgive her. Since you have so much goodness for her, I hope you'll pardon my offence too, madam. There will be no great difficulty in that, since I am guilty of an equal fault. Then pardons being passed on all sides. Pray, let's to church to conclude the day's work. But before you go, let me treat you, pray, with a song a new married lady made within this week. It may be of use to you both. When yielding first to Damon's flame, I sunk into his arms. He swore he'd ever be the same, then rifled all my charms. But fond of what he'd long desired, too greedy of his prey, my shepherd's flame, alas, expired before the verge of day. My innocence in lovers' wars reproached his quick defeat. Confused, ashamed, and bathed in tears, I mourned his cold retreat. At length, ah, shepherdess, cried he, would you my fire renew? Alas, you must retreat like me. I'm lost if you pursue. So, madam, 
Now had the parson but done his business. You'd be half weary of your bargain. No, sure. I might dispense with one night's lodging. I am ready to try, sir. Then let's to church, and if it be our chance to disagree. Take heed, the surly husband's fate you see. Exuant Omnis Epilogue No epilogue. Belinda, I swear I know of none. Lord, how shall we excuse it to the town? Why, we must even say something of our own. Our own? Ay, that must needs be precious stuff. I'll lay my life, they'll like it well enough. Come, Faith, begin. Excuse me, after you. Nay, pardon me for that. I know my cue. Oh, for the world, I would not have precedence. Oh, Lord. I swear. Oh, fie. I'm all obedience. First, then, know all, before our doom is fixed. The third day is for us. Nay, and the sixth. We speak not from the poet now, nor is it his cause, I want a rhyme, that we solicit. Then sure you cannot have the hearts to be severe and damn us. Damn us? Let em if they dare. Why? If they should, what punishment remains? Eternal exile from behind our scenes. But if they're kind, that sentence will recall. We can be grateful. And have wherewithal. But at grand treaties hope not to be trusted before preliminaries are adjusted. You know the time, and we appoint the place, where, if you please, We'll meet and sign the peace. End of Act 5 End of The Provoked Wife, a Comedy by John Van Brugh